Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the aquarium and the second day of our oil platform decommissioning forum. I'm Jerry Schubel. I want to welcome all of you. You have everyone's bios, and so that will save us time in making introductions because we have a jam-packed agenda and we are going to stay on time. The, I want to thank the students who created the posters that are out front and also Blue Latitudes who curated those posters. And last night, you heard some comments by Controller Yi and also from Dr. Mark Gold from the Ocean Protection Council. And uh, Sylvia Earle, we're expecting, will give her talk tonight at 7, and we hope that you'll all be able to come back for that talk, and that will be in the theater that you were in last, last night. This morning, Jessalyn Ashigo of the Honda Marine Science Foundation, which is a co-sponsor, <coughs> will offer a, a few words of welcome. Jessalyn, I'm assuming you're here. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> uh, welcome and thank you for coming. I'm Jessalyn. I work for Honda in the Environmental Business Development Office, and um, I'm a founding member of the Honda Marine Science Foundation, and so. This morning, I'd just like to share with you all a little bit of background about um, Honda's commitment to the environment <coughs> and the reason we started the Honda Marine Science Foundation. Um, for over 40 years, we have developed products that deliver on our commitment to the environment and sustainability and reducing our environmental footprint. And at Honda, we know that climate change is an incredible challenge and has an immense impact on us um, and also our oceans. So to address that challenge specifically, um, we had a president who was specifically interested in what we could do to address climate change and how it's affecting our oceans. So we created the Honda Marine Science Foundation, which is actually inspired by this Japanese concept called Sato Umi, which I think translated basically means like land and ocean but it speaks to the relationship between humans, land, the ocean, and having a, homo a harmonious relationship between all three of those um, spheres. So um, today's forum is a good example of Sato Umi, um, how the decommissioning of oil rigs, which is a human effort, um, how that can benefit marine life and how marine life can then also benefit humans. It's kind of like this harmonious cycle, and that's what we try to um, try to support when we're thinking about Sato Umi and our efforts with um, our Honda Marine Science Foundation. So uh, just wanted to keep it brief. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the forum. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Now I want to introduce Marina Voskonian, She's going to offer a few comments. Marina is the Division Chief for Mineral Resources Management Division of the California State Lands Commission. Marina. Thank you, Jerry. Let's see if this is going to work. Can you hear me? Good morning to all of you, and I wanted to welcome everyone and thank you for your interest in this important forum. I want to take a moment to express gratitude to the Tangwa people on whose lands this aquarium is built, who have lived on this coast and fished in these waters for countless generations. We recognize that California Native American heritage including cultural resources and practices, has remained resilient throughout California's history. And adding to the state's rich cultural legacy and diversity, Native people have maintained a constant presence on the landscape and they are essential storage partners, so we welcome and appreciate the voices of the tribal members participating in this forum. I'd like to take the, uh, this opportunity to recognize Chris Potter with Ocean Protection Council for initiating this commissioning forum 
and especially thank Jerry <laughs> and the Long Beach Aquarium for sponsoring, coordinating, and hosting this event and providing us with this wonderful venue. I'm the Division Chief of the State Lands Commission Mineral Resources Management Division, which is located right here in downtown Long Beach. And I'm pleased to be part of this forum representing our agency because we only not protect the state mineral resources for the public's benefit, but we also make sure that our offshore lands are taken care of responsibly after the resource development is finished. California has jurisdiction of the oil and gas minerals beneath state waters out to a distance of three miles from the coastline. Some of the lands where these oil minerals are located have been leased for development either from offshore platforms or from wells drilled directionally from onshore drill sites. This map shows the coastal area of our jurisdictions where our mineral leases are located and the locations of offshore platforms and structures where the oil and gas is being developed. There are four platforms, five man-made islands, two <clears throat> offshore piers with th within this three-mile state jurisdiction. It is appropriate that we're having uh, this forum here in Long Beach. One of the largest <coughs> offshore oil facilities in the world is right here, just a few hundred yards from the aquarium. These are four man-made islands that were built in 1965 and were named after American astronauts. These islands have been instrumental in developing the Wilmington oil field, one of the largest fields in the United States. Even though those islands are close to shore, the <coughs> mineral interests are managed by the city of Long Beach on behalf of the state. The state lands and mineral interests were granted in trust to the city by the state in 1911. These are pictures of other offshore oil facilities in state waters. Three of these structures, Platform Holly, the Elwood Pier, and Rincon Island, are currently not producing, and they are undergoing abandonment as we speak. Just a few years ago, these facilities were all, all active. It is timely that we are discussing this topic today, and this slide is testament to how quickly and unexpectedly, things can change in the oil and gas industry and underscores the necessity of the state and local government to prepare financially, legally, and technically for dealing with these structures when they are no longer producing. At the conclusion of my uh, remarks, Mr. Steve Curran, uh, la uh, our state lands senior drilling engineer will discuss the well abandonment and events that have been underway for these three facilities. And then later this afternoon, Mr. Seth Blackman, our state lands chief counsel, will discuss the circumstances which led to their abandonment and policy issues and legal concerns that the state must consider during the decision making process. In any decommissioning activities, it is important that the process of identifying responsible alternatives and comprehensively analyzing those alternatives is a transparent process founded in, on inclusive public engagement and the best available science. Open meaningful discussion and input among stakeholders, the private sector, non-government organizations, tribal governments, environmental justice communities, and the local government is vitally important. This forum is an important step in the ongoing process and the dialogue you engage in during this forum will be encouraged, welcome, and gratefully received. In today's program, we have great speakers who will be addressing some of the important issues of the offshore facility decommissioning. I hope you will enjoy this forum and take this opportunity to see this beautiful aquarium. I was trying to go fast because I know we have very limited time and we want to stay. <laughs> Thank you, 
Thank you, Marina. We're even ahead of schedule, which is good, and we're going to stay on, on schedule. Uh, there, there is a clock up front here. Each speaker will have 15 minutes. It will start to blink at one minute. And uh, when, when the one minute is over, if you're still at the podium, security is ordered to come in and remove you physically from the situation. All right, our first speaker is Steve Curran. He's a senior petroleum drilling engineer with the California State Lands Commission. Steve. Already on the timer. Thank you for the invitation to address you today. I'm going to start by providing a brief history of the Rincon oil field uh, decommissioning project and then uh, launch right into a brief overview of Platform Holly. Um, please. Uh, refrain from any questions until after I'm done with uh, both presentations. Thank you. Okay, as you can see uh, on this slide, the uh, this is the Rincon Island uh, oil and gas leases. The offshore island, uh, Rincon Island is 1466, and the two onshore leases is 410 and 145. The other leases shown 430, 429, and 427 compromise what's previously known as the mobile piers, and they were decommissioned in 1998 and taken out. You can see uh, another uh, location map over to the right side. This is a picture of Rincon Island and the causeway uh, where we have uh, um, 55 wells, I believe, uh, and it is a self-contained operation that produced oil and gas fluids were all separated on the island and transported via pipelines running along that causeway. And uh, it supports electrical power also to the island. This island was constructed in 1959. You can see that this is after we've done a lot of preparatory work and cleared the island, uh, uh, getting ready for the decommissioning. Okay, a little, um, a little uh, background on how we've handled the uh, onshore leases. Uh, in, the, in the highlighted blue area, that is sovereign land that is under state lands jurisdiction, and that is to the inland side of the current 101 uh, freeway. Uh, that's where the mean high tide line was pre construction of uh, the uh, 101 freeway. So the surface facilities that incorporate the leases 410 and 145 are split into private land and also uh, state lands jurisdiction land. Uh, six acres belongs to uh, state lands and 4.9 acres is private land with Coast Ranch. Uh, the wells uh, were drilled um, from onshore and directionally drilled to offshore. Uh, developing uh, the balance of the field that was left from the 14-6 uh, directional wells. There were uh, 27 wells drilled from onshore, and uh, there are actually two private wells, which were Coast Ranch, for a total of 27. Okay, here's a brief history of uh, what has happened in the recent past. In August of 2016, Rincon Island Limited Partnership filed for bankruptcy. Um, a trustee was appointed in 2017. They were under a, uh, a Dogger, actually Dogger is now CalGEM, so a Division of Oil and Gas is now a CalGEM, order for, uh, for safety uh, concerns on the island because the wells had been shut in for many years and had, uh, um, had pressured up at the surface. So during that time, uh, drill tech was, uh, was hired by the trustee to be an overseer caretaker, and then they were officially hired as our contractor for the decommissioning in uh, June of 2018. September of 2018, we started the onshore well abandonments, uh, activated a, a abandonment rig, and then in January of 2019, 
we activated the uh, offshore uh, drilling rig uh, for the abandonments offshore. We anticipate being done with the well abandonments uh, by 2021 of June. This picture shows there's one big common cellar which has 68 well slots, six, uh, six feet on center, and then there is one other uh, 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 69th location is in a separate cellar just out of the picture to the bottom left. Um, this picture was taken before we did a lot of uh, hot tapping and surface work. We had to do a lot of valve replacements and, uh, and wellhead uh, replacements and upgrading before we could start the work. This is a picture on, on the island. This is a cement plant that we installed prior to the work because there's a lot of cementing to go on with the, with the, uh, with the 55 wells. Um, we've got cement silos uh, and a uh, cementing unit. You can see the super sacks are 2,000 pounds of um, the, the dry powdered uh, concrete um, for installation in the, in the cement silos um, for all the cementing work for all the wells. This is a picture of rigging up on the first well. Um, this is our uh, drilling rig off to the right side. This is a picture of BOPs installed. These are blowout prevention equipment that are for, uh, for safety, uh, surface safety. These are a double set of pipe rams that are installed on well number 15 which is one of the deeper, higher pressure wells. This is all to make sure that um, pressures and fluids are all contained within the well and uh, for safety. Okay, so in the cycle of an oil well or a gas well, you need to have everything on the surface uh, upgraded and able to handle the pressures and the fluids. Then what you've got to do is get out all of the tubulars, um, the tubing, the pumps, whatever's inside the well, and then you have to put in a series of cement plugs across the oil and gas zones, across the markers, across the top of the oil and gas zones, protect potable fresh water, and then put in surface plugs. So that's how the cycle of an abandonment works on an oil and gas well. In many of these wells, we had uh, submersible pumps and cabling and tubing that was stuck in the wells, and we had to actually go in and get it out. So this is one of the bigger jobs we had to do, 19, 1,900 feet of cable was uh, electrical armor um, bands and uh, electrical cable and the pump was fished out of this well. We call it fishing when we're recovering this stuff. So you can see we're right at the bottom of the well here uh, at the pump, and we're, we're getting the, uh, the cable and the pump to surface at this point. Then it'll be ready for plugs. Uh, one of the main problems with these, uh, this reservoir at Rincon was um, it's a sandstone reservoir, and there's a lot of flower sand. So I have some uh, samples up here. If you can uh, take a look in handy wipes if you want to look at it. Uh, this is what we were dealing with, is uh, cleaning out pumps, cleaning out tubing, recovering uh, everything out of the well, and then cleaning out flower sand uh, before we could install all these cement plugs. Okay, when you get up to the surface and you're dealing with, uh, with fresh water and uh, protection of potable water, um, you have to recover some of the casings uh, down at around the 700 foot level on land. On offshore, we didn't have that issue because there was no potable water to protect. So this is one of the uh, pieces of equipment we use. You have to cut casing jack out the casing. These are casing jacks on the left. You can see where we've uh, taken off the wellhead here after we've cut the casing and jacked it off, jacked it uh, out. And then you can see all the, the casing that was recovered. That's eight and five inch casing on this well, 680 feet. Okay, there's a lot of sub projects within the projects and this is on the causeway uh, that connects from shore out to the island. 
this is a single pier. It's pier number 72 is severely corroded, about 75% um, disconnected and, and corroded around. So we did this job over um, the holiday, of course, over Christmas. So um, in, <laughs> yeah, nice Christmas. So um, what's happened here is we had to build a, uh, a structure called a strong back, which is actually uh, cement girders that are put together with, um, with steel bracing. And it had to span 80 feet. So it had to go, to go across the bad pile to the good piles on either side. And then we could go in, take off the deck, go down underneath and install a, a, a sleeve, which is, which is uh, shown in this next picture. There's the half of the cement sleeve. Here's the cement sleeve being uh, taken over and put in. And then um, on, the, on the last picture, uh, looking down, you can see, you're looking down into the working area and you can, you can barely see that the sleeve is attached, it's chained on, it's ready to be welded. And of course, this is all the scaffolding that's underneath the pier. So all that's been done, uh, it's been inspected, and we're back up to where we have our rating that we need to go back and forth across the causeway. We had to go uh, with boats for about a week until we got this repair work done. Okay, switching gears. Uh, uh, these are just some pictures of the sunset and um, another picture of our, our cement plant. Etc. So the onshore well abandonments is next. Um, once you have done all of the well abandonment work, then you have to deal with cutting off the well heads and taking them out below ground level and removing the cellars. All of these are in cement or, or brick lined structures that are that provide containment for the fluids around the wells. So you can see all of this work that I'm going to show you now, the surface abandonment project is onshore. It's not offshore. Remember, offshore has the common cellar with the 68 well slots. So these are all onshore. So some of these wells um, are, uh, well cellars are 15 foot deep. They require confined space, safety procedures, safety harnessing. We've got to have rescue people above. We have to have breathing air. It's a whole... Um, safety procedure you need to do to, to get down in the cellars and to excavate and to uh, remove them. So when you, get, when you get the cellars excavated and taken out all of the concrete, then at the, the surface is cut off. These are bubble tested with, uh, with water and soap and for, for cow gem, the former uh, dogger. And then a, well, a plate is welded on, tack welded on and identified. And that represents the final <laughs> surface abandonment for these onshore wells. Okay, this shows, I have a, a sample of rebar from the 40s. Um, these are some of the cement structures that we found um, while excavating from five to 10 feet. That's a requirement. And so the, remember, the, all the fill came in um, to the old uh, Highway 101 before they did the, the new um, 101 freeway. And so there was a whole um, oil field or oil, uh, facility and associated structures in the 1940s that we had to deal with that's between the two foot and 10 foot level. So it's kind of like the curse of Oak Island is, is what we're dealing with on shore. Okay, so here's some of the cement that you see coming out. Um, to date, we have excavated um, over um, a thousand tons of concrete. We expected to have only six to seven hundred. It looks like we're going to end up with about two thousand tons. So we've already processed eleven hundred tons, which is equivalent to a would be equivalent to a solid cement block of one hundred and twenty by one hundred and twenty by one hundred and twenty feet high. So you can imagine how much concrete that is. This is processing concrete, cement spoils, and you can see when we're done with the surface site, you can see that we're, uh, you can see over to the right, we're at, um, it looks like it's right back to its natural state. Okay, more concrete, and now uh, the current status, okay. Um, 
the offshore, we have 25 of 50 wells abandoned. Um, onshore, 26 of 27, we have an injector still to do. We're using that uh, for injection until we get done with the offshore. Um, the onshore rig was demobilized uh, late last year in November, and the rig is on schedule. We're uh, 3 million, uh, or approximately 10% uh, below of the cost plan, even though we have all of this extra concrete and everything to deal with, we're still below the planned cost. Uh, anticipated project completion is June of 2021. Final disposition of the causeway in Rincon Island to be determined through the CEQA process with public involvement, EI uh, environmental impact report, alternatives is a year, it'll take a year or more to approve and then select a contractor and then it'll take several years to decide what we're going to do uh, with the island and the causeway. The surface facility is pretty much all going to be restored. Okay, I'm going to go on to Platform Holly now with, oh boy, with, with, there we go, to Platform Holly. All right, so Platform Holly is our second big project that we're doing for decommissioning. Um, uh, this is a picture of uh, the refurbished Platform Holly. It took two years to get in that condition. Um, that would enable us to uh, plug and abandon the 30 wells that are on the structure, um, that are drilled from the structure. The structure and the pipelines are protected from corrosion uh, and all of the, uh, the maintenance and the inspections were all are all done during this time. It's like it's an active platform, so we're not treating it as it's idle or in the decommissioning phase. One of the biggest projects that we did was uh, was um, replacement of all the living quarters and upgrading. Um, you can see by the pictures on the left um, that um, uh, it's in a big state of disrepair. It was all um, condemned and unusable. So if you look um, over to the right, you can see the crane lifts that were required to get the new modules in. And so um, these are six, uh, six new modules that are in um, for all the workers for the two years of, or two to three years of the well abandonments that are gonna go on. Okay, the main problem with Platform Holly is it was erected in 1966 in 211 feet of water. It's a very small platform and um, there is a lot of equipment that is needed for the plug and abandonment. So um, a lot of the the platform was in a state of um, a declining um, in a declining status and needed to be refurbished, and a lot of equipment needed to be replaced and uh, and some equipment removed so that we could have uh, clear decks and move in other equipment. Um, if you look at um, down in the left hand corner, you can see in the older platform configuration, the helideck, and the new platform configuration, um, that uh, helideck is now half gone diagonally and operates as a crane rest. So everything was, um, was not only fixed and refurbished or, or, or taken off, but it was also repurposed. This is the clear deck project. So if you look at the helideck up here, you can, underneath are compressors, ethylene glycol unit, a, a lot of equipment that was removed, and then you can see what I was talking about with, uh, with the uh, operating as a crane rest now. These are uh, some more changes in progress. The uh, up above is how we used to handle drill pipe, um, the old V door, and you can see the pipe would come out of the well, you would, it would slide down on the catwalk and, and be handled with personnel. Now everything is automated. So one of the new big upgrades is a knuckle boom crane, which has taken everything from vertical and, and has converted it to horizontal with, um, with no human interaction of, of, of hands on. So you can see the knuckle boom crane is, is over in the top right hand corner. So it actually picks up the pipe turns it horizontally, puts it in a tray, brings it down to the deck, and then it can be dealt with to be transported to shore and, and uh, taken for um, disposal or for, um, or, or for sale. All right, safety is job number one. This is just a, 
I'm not gonna go through all of these, but there are a lot of safety plans, a lot of considerations, and this is only a sampling. It's probably at least double this. So there's a, there's a lot of um, things that go on. This is an H2S platform, so it has um, uh, a lot of contingency planning with that. We've had to upgrade air systems. We are operating 24 hours. It's a little different than RENCON. RENCON is five days a week. Uh, platform Holly is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Okay. So, in, in closing, what we're doing is abandonment of the wells is in two phases. We have, uh, right now, we have a coil tubing unit active on the platform, and it is going to address 16 of the wells. We have completed six of the wells, and so there is 10 more to go. We anticipate being done with that sometime in April, and then we'll go to conventional abandonments with uh, with an actual full-scale rig that's, and pull the tubulars and do things conventionally. Um, the coil tubing is done under pressure with all the wells sealed and everything goes back in the formation for safety. I'm gonna skip through these. There is an onshore facility, the gas facility that, that handles the, the gas. It provides the electric, electricity to the platform and uh, there is a very small amount of gas that still comes from the wells that is, that is treated and keeps the onshore uh, facility active. I'm gonna close with that and not get into 421. Thank you. Yes, way too much to do for this, but thank you. Yes. We're gonna hold Q&A until uh, the end of this morning session. Our next speaker is John Smith. John is an OCSD commissioning consultant and he was very helpful to us in putting together this forum. John. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, the talk, my talk today, I'm going to be uh, covering the OCS platforms and their operating status. Uh, the topics I'm going to cover are the location, water depth, size of the facilities, their, uh, their decommissioning outlook, and some of the decommissioning challenges that are going to be faced by the companies that have to remove these facilities. This map uh, shows the uh, offshore facilities of California. There's 32 facilities. There's uh, 23 OCS platforms, uh, four state water platforms and five artificial islands. As I noted, I'm gonna focus on the uh, OCS platforms, which are, are the black, black dots on this uh, map. And the majority of the platforms, OCS platforms, these are more than three miles offshore, are located in the uh, eastern Santa Barbara Channel. There's 12 facilities there. Uh, as you move up the coast, you have three facilities, the San Inez unit, which is off, located off Santa Barbara County. And then you move up to the far uh, offshore, uh, this is the Santa Maria Basin, and there are four platforms up there. And once again, that's offshore Vandenberg Air Force Base <laughs> in Santa Barbara County. And the remaining four platforms, let's see, I can't really see, are down in the LA area. Uh, right offshore here, uh, here there's four platforms in, in the beta unit on the OCS. Uh, so uh, if we look at uh, kind of the vital statistics of OCS platforms, we have 23 platforms, the age range is 28 to 50 years, water depth uh, really shallow, 95 feet to ultra deep, almost 1,200 feet of water. Removal weights, uh, small platform, GINA, 1,380 tons. And then Harmony is the largest platform, the deepest water platform, it's 86,513 tons. So the operating status, we have 12 producing platforms. We have 11 that are shut in, that are not producing. And five in the early stages of decommissioning planning. Uh, this table shows the details about the OCS platforms. You can see the year installed, the operating status, uh, the wells, et cetera, the operator, and so on and so forth. So this kind of follows the map I just talked about, showing you the location of the platforms. 
if we start uh, offshore Long Beach and the beta unit, whoops, sorry. Uh, the beta unit, we have four platforms. They're all operating. There's no plans to decommission these platforms at the present time. Uh, as we move into the eastern Santa Barbara Channel, we have 12 platforms, and you can see that five of these platforms are shut in, not producing. And Hogan and Houchin, uh, in October 2019, uh, they, uh, they were shut in. Uh, but that was the most recent shut-in platform. And moving down, we have uh, those, those platforms are, BC is owned by Signal Hill Services, Inc., operated by uh, Cooey Pacific, operated as Offshore, Inc. So, uh, like I said, there's no de plans for decommissioning in those at this time, but they are uh, not producing. Moving down, we have uh, three other platforms that are shut-in, Habitat, Habitat was shut in in 19, uh, well, 20, uh, 19, let's see, uh, a few years ago. It really has a, it's a gas production platform and the market for gas was very poor. So uh, that basically shut in, I think, in 2017. And then Gale and Grace, Gale and Grace was shut in in 2017 as well. You probably you might have heard uh, Benico filed for bankruptcy and relinquished their leases. But Chevron uh, is in uh, the predecessor lessee, and they're involved in planning for the new relation center. Uh, Hondo Harmony and Heritage, they were shut in as a result of the uh, uh, pipeline break, a uh, huge oil sp spill onshore, and that the Plains All-American Pipeline, that they that was back in 2015 that that break occurred and it really eliminated the uh, production. Production had to cease at the platform because they couldn't uh, pipeline their pro products at the refineries. So that's, they still, they're still in that status of being shut in. Exxon's trying to get approval to truck some of the oil, but they're gonna have to drill 183 miles, I think, of new pipelines, which could be many, several years before that gets permitted and approved. And then we move down to the Santa Maria Basin. We have Harvest, Hermosa, Hidalgo. But those were, uh, are operated by Freeport MacMoran. Uh, those leases were terminated in 2017. And, and the Chevron and Freeport MacMoran are in the early stages of planning for the removal of those facilities. So why are we at this point? Well, one of the reasons is uh, the age range of the OCS platforms. Uh, the typical design life of a platform is 25 to 30 years. If you take our 23 OCS platforms, you can see all that are, are plus 25, 21 are plus 30, 13 are plus 35 years of generation, six are plus 40. So this is a, an indicator that uh, decommissioning is on the, on the horizon, one of the leading indicators. Another leading indicator is the production smokers. As you can see in this slide, that oil production peaked about 72 million barrels <coughs> in 1995. Gas production <coughs> peaked a couple five years later, around 2000, and we've had a steady decline. Today there's about five million barrels of oil being produced a year and about four during heated season natural gas. So this just reflects the depletion of the reserves and the life of the field. And another indicator of the decommissioning is you know, not too far off. Oh, sorry. So here's the decommissioning outlook at this time. Uh, the red are ongoing projects. Okay. How's this? It's better. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, th this is where we stand at this point uh, in the Santa Maria Basin. There are three platforms: Harvest, Mosa, Hidalgo, that are in a decommissioning mode. Western Santa Barbara Channel, nothing, 
Now you can see that there's quite a bit, likely to be quite a bit of activity in the eastern Santa Barbara Channel. We have Gale and Grace, and then we have three other platforms that are shut in that could potentially be near-term candidates for decommissioning. So uh, likelihood is there's going to be quite a bit of activity offshore Ventura County and Santa Barbara County in the upcoming years as far as decommissioning is concerned. Uh, this is an interesting slide. It shows the scale of uh, the decommissioning that's upcoming. You can see the water depths of the platforms. You have Gale, Grace, Harvest, Hermosa, four or 600, 700 foot water depth platforms, which means they're very large. And you can see the weights range from 13,000 to almost 37,000 tons. Uh, in comparison, Holly's you know, quite small compared to the, these platforms. Uh, another measure is the last decommissioning project was the Chevron 4-H project, occurred in 1996, uh, and there were four platforms removed. The total tonnage for those platforms was about 10,000 tons or 2,000 tons per platform. So you can see that the future decommissioning, the, the scale is going to be much larger than what has occurred in the past. So now we get to the challenges, and I'm not going to, I'm going to go through these pretty quick. There's a paper that I, I'm Bob Bird author that I'll refer you to later, and you can pick up more information on this. But in California, you have large structures limited and limited deep water removal experience. We have lack of infrastructure, very high mobilization costs for heavy lift vessels, limited onshore processing and disposal options, and untested and prob potentially problematic rigs to reef process, complex regulatory framework, and site clearance is always an issue. Uh, this is an interesting slide. It shows the water depths of the platforms, which is, uh, mirrors the size of the platforms. But as I mentioned, the Chevron 4-H platforms were in 120 feet of water, 100 feet of water roughly. And the world record for decommissioning offshore platforms uh, affixed to the seabed is probably around 500 feet of water depth. So you can see that projects upcoming, Harvest and Gale, are going to set new world records when they occur, possibly. And uh, the largest platform is Harmony. And it's interesting to see the Harmony is almost equivalent in size to the Empire State Building. So you can imagine the engineering challenges that are going to be faced in trying to carry forth projects like this. This is a uh, this slide shows Harmony as its jacket. It's being loaded out in, in Korea, uh, South Korea, and you can see the scale of this fa these facilities. Even uh, Harvest Hermosa Hidalgo, you know, you take seventy percent of that. This is underwater, and this is what you have to dismantle underwater. Once again, the challenges are daunting. Uh, limited onshore disposal options. Uh, there's a, a SA recycling facility in Long Beach. Primarily, primarily produce, uh, produce processes, industrial scrap, uh, autos, rail cars, that type of thing. Has limited capacity and crane capability. The Chevron 4-H platforms were actually taken there. They, those were around 10,000 tons total, four platforms. Gale and Grace project alone could be, would result in 50,000 tons going to shore, five times the Chevron project. The Point Oguayo platforms w w total 90,000 tons, nine times the Chevron platforms. So you have a, a need for major upgrades or capacity expansion or alternative disposition sites. Uh, obviously, there, there's potential for some significant onshore impacts. You know, taking all this material to shore, transporting it, processing it, landfills, all those types of issues. So this is a, this is a big challenge for companies that want to decommission it in California. Where, did, where, where are you going to take the material? Uh, the, now, reefing could solve some of that. You wouldn't need to take that much material to shore. But the, the California Marine Resources Legacy Act was passed in 2010. There's been no reefing that's occurred. No platforms have been reefed since the act was passed. 
It's, so, it's an untested and complex process. It's a high cost to set up and manage the reefing program. There's also a net environmental benefit determination that has to be made that has to be positive to get approval to reef a platform. And if you, companies that reef platforms also have to share the cost savings compared to full removal with the state. And currently that's 65%, but before, but it's going to be 80% of the cost savings need to be shared with the state uh, in 2023. Another issue is the liability continues uh, for industry perpetuity, and uh, there's some concern that uh, those provisions within the act are very onerous and may not be workable. So, summary. I'm almost on time. <laughs> okay, one minute to go. Decommissioning is fast approaching, 2025, 2026. We can expect uh, possibly physical removal to actually start. Many platforms have reached or are approaching the end of their economic life, COP is the cessation of production. The 2020 to 2030 decade will likely see 50% of the platforms decommissioned, up, which would be 10 or 12 possibly. Upcoming projects will be world class in scale. Full removal will present major engineering and environmental challenges. Reefing of jackets would reduce the challenges, but it's problematic absent uh, amendments probably to the AB 2503, which is the California Marine Legacy Act, which allows uh, the jackets of OCS platforms to be reefed in, in place. So uh, for more information, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Bob Bird and I wrote a paper. It was presented in OTC, at the OTC in Houston in 2018. And it talks about these issues in greater detail. So uh, you can find it probably on the web there, but uh, I can also uh, see me afterwards if you're interested in that. I can get you copies. So. Thank you, John. Wow. <laughs> what? Do I, get a, do I get a prize for hitting on zero? We we'll give you your prize. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, as I mentioned before, we're going to hold our questions until the end of this session. Our next speaker is Ann Scarborough Bull. She's a project scientist with the Marine Science Institute, Institute at UC Santa Barbara. And she's going to talk about life beneath California platforms. Ann? Thank you very much. I want to uh, especially thank uh, Jerry Schraubel and the Aquarium of the Pacific for holding this forum and inviting me to speak. My assignment from Jerry and the Aquarium was to uh, talk about life under the platforms. And today I'm representing uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, and I am not only going to talk uh, and uh, tell you the story about life under the platforms, but also share with you uh, what it took, an enormous effort by researchers um, to actually gather this information on life under the platforms and life on our natural reefs in Southern California. If you want to read all the scientific articles that support all of the information I'm going to be giving you today, here's just four of them. Uh, I'm, I think the aquarium is going to have this electronically available, and you'll be able to directly go to these uh, um, scientific peer-reviewed scientific papers if you want. This research was funded by the U.S. Geological Survey, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and a very small percentage uh, was funded by the California Artificial Reef Enhancement Project, which helped us pay our scuba divers. Uh, and they were very grateful for that small amount. Uh, students go, don't get paid a lot. And we have a scientific dive team 
that um, we use at the University of California. So you've seen, I believe, this uh, diagram last night. Um, platforms are the most substantial per purpose-built man-made structures in the world. They're located in every ocean basin. There's probably between six and 7,000 platforms um, installed in the world. About half of those actually are in the Gulf of Mexico off the United States. Um, with perhaps another, I, you know, I can never actually find these numbers uh, for how many are in state waters in Louisiana and Texas. But about half of all the platforms in the world are in the United States water. And as you've been told, there's 23 platforms in federal waters. That's beyond the three li mile limit and four standing platforms um, in California state waters. Here's the important um, structure part of the platforms I will be speaking about. It's the offshore jacket. It's actually the underwater support structure. Um, this, uh, as we've learned, is uh, um, a photograph of Platform Harmony, which is installed off Santa Barbara uh, County. Um, all of the platforms, including the state platforms, you get this amazing water depth from 35 feet to 1,250 feet uh, for Platform Harmony. Uh, I was in the sub uh, down at the bottom of Harmony, and we, uh, as the sub was creaking, because it was very, very deep, we were measuring 1,250 feet at the base of the platform, and the pilot didn't want to stay there very long, and we, we were counting fish, and uh, he kept hammering us to come up and come up, so we did. Obviously, I'm standing here, so it was no problem. Um, the important thing about the platforms, I think, one very important thing, is to understand that each and every one of them span the entire water column where they exist. Um, and uh, they go from the sea floor through the sea surface. The, the, most, uh, the most similar natural underwater uh, reef structure that we have to compare these two is a seamount. And there actually are not very many seamounts um, in the world. So it's in the vertical relief and the internal open complexity of these structures are quite unique. Talk about nooks and, and crannies. There are millions of nooks and crannies that develop uh, on these structures, and they per, uh, provide a large amount of habitat over a small footprint. Like the footprint might be um, eight to 10 acres at the bottom, and yet the vertical and complexity of these structures uh, are adding a great deal of habitat over that small foot. They are open structures, and these allow for a lot of water circulation. They also dissipate energy from big waves and storms. And um, there's relative easy mobility for fishes inside the structures. So um, how did we get these observations and 17 years worth of information that I'm only touching the surface of these today, this information for you? Well, we used scuba divers, and we used submersibles and remotely operated vehicles at coastal sites and beneath platforms. Between 1995 and 2013, we visited all 23 federal platforms. Uh, occasionally, we were able to get to Holly, but we weren't able to get to the other state platforms. And 70 natural reefs were surveyed with repetitive 15-minute transects for fishes, for species numbers and sizes. Um, the platforms and natural reefs were visited uh, from 1 to 16 times, and we made 170 separate visits, each one of which um, entailed multiple dives in those 17 years. Um, we saw and counted and sized and ID'd to the lowest taxa over a million and a half fish from greater than 100 species. And we actually performed uh, a little over 2,000 15-minute transects. It was a huge effort. 
And those of us at UCSB um, and a few from Cal State University in Long Beach and myself were there every minute. Um, it, was a, it, it was a huge effort. So just using um, uh, one of the submersibles, the Delta submersibles from 1995 to 2009, uh, here's just some data, some figures, total number of dives over 800, about the same number of dives at platforms as natural reefs. Um, total number of transects uh, was a uh, little over 2,000. Uh, total area of surveys was once again uh, some astounding numbers, um, 1,244,342 square meters were surveyed and the fish counted and ID'd and measured to size over that time. So to get to the life under the platforms, there are four major underwater environmental zones. The very shallow zone, some people call it the surf zone, and um, the shallow surf zones and edging downward are covered with millions of invertebrates. Certainly in the very shallow areas, you have mussels, uh, uh, several different species, and uh, rock scallops that grow to their maximum size and the number of species and the densities decrease with depth. The midwaters of the platform are populated by uh, fishes, a lot of fishes, smaller adults, older juveniles, and seasonally there are hundreds of thousands of young of the year rock fishes on the platforms. Um, there are, again, as you go deeper and get to the bases of the platforms, you have substantial numbers of larger adult species, including rockfish, lingcod, sand dabs, and scorpionfish that populate the bottom of the jacket base. Um, storms and also the operators will, um, on a regular basis, clean off like the top 30 feet of the platforms. Uh, and the bivalve shells fall to the bottom, either from the storms or from the purposeful cleaning, to decrease the drag on these structures at the surface, fall to the bottom, and that's what forms the shell mounds that you hear about. It's shells from the top of the jacket. So what about life under the platforms? Well, as far as invertebrates are concerned, there the uh, platforms maintain a highly diverse and large size range of invertebrates. And the mussels, at least, have been harvested for human consumption for decades. They were harvested by a company called Ecomar, which was run by Bob Meeks in Santa Barbara. After Bob Meeks uh, passed away, Ecomar uh, closed as a company, and they're not harvested for human consumption anymore. They are harvested as bait in the trap fishery, especially the crab trap fishery. So there are non-native and highly unusual species of invertebrates. They can be locally abundant on the platforms, as they also can be in the harbors and on natural reefs, nearby natural reefs. Shell mounds support a substantial benthic community of fishes, sea stars, and commercially important shellfish. The fishes. Of all the fish species observed, and we observed greater than 100 species at the platforms and natural reefs, over 90% of them are rockfish uh, in the genus Sebastes. Now, the number and size of rockfish, of adult rockfish, size and maturity of adult rockfish is higher and larger, respectively, under platforms. What this means is that there are greater numbers of fish overall at the platforms, but also the species and how big they get when they're mature are uh, in greater number at platforms. What you see at the natural reefs is uh, a lot of small, some people call them dwarf species, like the pygmy rockfish. So what you get is large numbers of rockfish that don't grow up to be very big. Um, 
Another thing about the fish is, and perhaps one of the most important things about the fish that come and reside at the platforms is that there are in some years greater than 100,000 and on one particular platform in one year we were able to count between 400 and 500,000 young of the year rockfish at a single platform. Um, many platforms have greater than 100,000 young of the year um, baby rockfishes, but we were only, you know, we're only able to go out at certain times of the year. So at, at several platforms we counted in, in one year, um, we, it, no, in multiple years, we were able to determine that these young of the year rockfish constituted 20% of the average yearly abundance for some rockfish species throughout the range, and their range is from upper Alaska to lower Baja. So what, okay, that's all well and good, but what's the condition of these fishes that live under the platform? We did some studies to actually look at this and look for this information. We were able to determine that the growth rate of younger year rockfish under platforms is the same or better when compared to identical species along the Santa Barbara coast. We also looked at contaminant levels, and we looked at um, the tissues. We used the tissues that people eat. So we looked at the actual fillet tissues. We also looked at, um, at gonadal tissues, because certain contaminants um, are uh, lipid-soluble, fat-soluble, and they go into um, gonadal materials. And we looked at the central nervous system. And the contaminant level of adult fishes under platforms is the same as the rest of the California um, levels of contamination in shoreline populations when compared to identical species. And the species we chose to look at are species like sand dabs that live near the bottom, live near the shell mounds, and uh, don't move very far. They're certainly not to com going to commute to the shoreline if they're living at the offshore platform. So we, we chose species that don't move around very far. We went as far away as Catalina Island to collect species and to look at this. The other sort of surprising phenomenon that, that happened to us while we were looking at site fidelity is we had an opportunity to move some radio-tagged adult rockfish from platforms Gale and Grace over to brand new marine protected areas at Anacapa Island because they were doing some uh, tracking experiments on fish species over at Anacapa. So we were able to use some of the radioacoustic uh, uh, tracking equipment over on Anacapa. So we transplanted some fishes over to there. And uh, many of those, a high percentage of those fish swam back to the platforms. Um, that, was a, that was a big surprise. You know, science is really a lot of fun, but you just have to have funding. But a lot of things are like, really? Uh, show me those data again. All right. Um, so, you know, so what? I mean, what could you do with this information or these populations? Well, if you wanted to, you could probably use them as a fisheries conservation tool because they're not fished. They're very rarely fished by people that, are, that go out there or are actually on the platforms. There's a higher potential larval production at platforms than at nearby natural reefs. And in 2006, the Pacific Fishery Management Council, this is 2006. I was chosen as one of the reviewers for this document. In 2006, the Pacific Fishery Management Council recommended that 13 platforms be designated as habitat areas of particular concern uh, under the essential fish habitat um, designation. Um, but the uh, um, regional NOAA administrator did not want to get into uh, man-made artificial reefs versus natural reefs at the time, and he would not sign that recommendation. It's never been addressed or brought up again. Uh, our next speaker 
is going to talk about this subject, which was published by the uh, United States uh, National Academy of Sciences, and this was the title of the paper. Uh, I was one of the authors, but our next speaker, uh, Jeremy Clays, was the um, senior author on this paper, and we'll get more information about that. I wanted to thank you very much for your time. And Jeremy Clays has already, already had an introduction, but I will add that he's a, an associate professor at Cal State Poly Pomona, and he's also a member of the Aquarium's Marine Conservation Research Institute Board of Directors. Jeremy. All right, uh, thanks, Jerry. Uh, happy to be here and talk about the work uh, that we've been doing over the last uh, 10 years or so, at least in my part, and um, working with Dan Pondella at the um, Van Tuna Research Group at Occidental College. Uh, before I was at, or before I'm now at Cal Poly Pomona. Um, I'll preface this by saying all the data here was collected by Ann, Milton Love, Donna Schrader, and their colleagues, and then we've taken that data um, and done a lot of statistics and modeling with it. Um, I'll just reiterate uh, what a couple other uh, presenters already talked about, that these are really big stretch structures. The smaller ones, maybe you're on the scale of a 10 to 20 story building. The large ones are on the scale of something like the Eiffel Tower um, or the Empire State Building. So um, there's a lot of habitat there. One thing we found, if we want to look at um, the fish living on these platforms, is that the depth that the platform is sitting in makes a lot of difference. Um, there's a wide variety in terms of some are in you know, 100 feet of water, a couple hundred feet of water, to those that are in 1,000 feet of water, 1,200 feet of water. Um, and so we've a most recent study we did, uh, we looked at the fish assemblages of the, um, on the different platforms, and we looked at them at different depth zones. So we basically divided up all those transects that they did um, into 50 meter or 150 foot depth zones. Um, and depth makes a lot of difference. And basically, if you compare um, the same depth, zo depth zone in two different platforms, the fish assemblage there, so that's the types of species and the relative amounts of those species are gonna be more similar in the same depth zone on two different platforms as compared with if you compare it to shallow and a deep depth zone on the same platform. So the fish get different um, in terms of how many there are and what species as you move down. Uh, additionally, there's that base habitat that's really important and that's where the platform structure meets the seabed. It's kind of covered with um, uh, those falling shell mounds um, and it creates this really complex habitat. That's where you find the most fishes, the largest fishes. Um, so what creates this difference in the fish assemblage? Um, one kind of general thing that's not too surprising is certain species have preferences for where they live. Um, so there's some species, like these are four of the most abundant um, species of the or probably top 15 species that we find on the platforms. There's some, like the ones you see um, above, that you'll find primarily in the top uh, 500 feet of the platform. Um, so if uh, the platform is, you know, only goes down a couple hundred feet, these fish might reside on um, the whole platform in, uh, in one form or another. Um, on a very deep platform, you're only gonna find them maybe in the top half, and then as you go deeper, you'll find other species that are only found in really deep waters. Um, so that's kind of superficially what creates some of these differences. Uh, but what I think is more important, and to me more interesting in terms of fish production, um, on these platforms is that individual species will occupy different depths of the platforms at different life stages or different sizes, different ages. Um, so as Ann alluded to, the, um, in kind of the midwater portion up away from the bottom, you find thousands to hundreds of thousands of um, young of the year, or fish less than a year old, um, that are recruiting to these platforms after they've spent um, a month or a number of months out in the open ocean. And then as those fish grow, and for at least some species, they move down the platforms, and down at the base is where you find the largest, oldest individuals. Um, what's even more interesting, I think, is um, if you compare platforms that are sitting at different depths. So this is three different platforms. So Grace, that sits at about 300 feet. Um, Gale, that sits at 700 feet. And Eureka, that sits at 700 feet. So two much deeper platforms. And then this is those depth zones that I alluded to, so top 150 feet and so on. 
and then you have the base of Grace and the base of Gale and Eureka. And these are size structure diagrams. So the, the body length of the fishes down here and then how, meant, how much of them um, is the height of the bar. And generally what you see is the fish are recruiting to these platforms, so the smallest individuals, um, maybe around 100 feet, 50 to 150 feet or so. And then as you go down, the fish get bigger. Basically, the, these boccaccio are growing. Um, so over two to three years or so, they're moving down the platform. And you see the mean size gets larger as you go down. Um, interestingly, when you get to a platform like Grace, where it's not that deep, um, the adult boccaccio, their preference is to live in much deeper water. So they're going to leave that platform. We're assuming they're going to move to um, deeper natural rocky reefs, um, probably somewhat close. Uh, but you don't see large numbers at all of adults at the base of that platform. However, for deeper platforms, where the bases are in that preferred depth zone, you're going to find um, large numbers of adult boccaccio. Um, so the depth of the platform is going to make a big difference in not only the species you see there, but also um, if they're young fish occupying those habitats or adult uh, fish occupying those, those platforms as well. All right, so here's kind of a, a schematic um, that I've used to try to explain um, this fish production work. Um, so this is uh, Boccaccio again, um, and this is kind of a, a very sort of crude representation of um, each year, the fish are growing. Um, two things are happening. Fish are dying. Um, when fish are young, real high mortality rates, not many survive, very low percentages year to year. Um, but every year, some fish die, and then some fish grow. So we, about, I don't know, six or seven years ago now, we worked on um, calculating the fish production. So that's the amount of new weight of fish that you get um, we scale it to a given year and a given um, area of habitat. Um, so we basically remove all the fish that die, and then for the um, remaining fish, we use um, published growth rates um, and length size relationships to convert the, um, the observed length of a fish. How much weight is that fish going to gain over a given year? And then we add it all up. Um, so we do that across all the species that we observed in the um, platforms and the natural reefs um, that were in this study. Uh, these are the top four um, species in terms of uh, most production on the platforms themselves. Um, it varies dramatically from platform to platform in terms of what species. Um, typically, while there are 116 in the study, um, it's probably 10 or so per platform that are really producing um, a large proportion of the overall production, um, and the other species are relatively rare. Um, but we did this, and we calculated production for all the, um, I think it is 16 or 17 platforms, um, seven or so natural reefs. Uh, for this study, we used only sites where they'd been surveyed at least five years. Um, so we wanted to have a, a good amount of data to go into this. Um, and basically what we found is that if you average across oops, uh, all of the, the platforms um, compared to the natural reefs in our study, um, they're about 27 times more productive in terms of um, new amount of weight you get, um, uh, fish weight or growth on those platforms. And the converting things to gain in weight or biomass is um, nice, I think, in one respect because um, in terms of predators or consumers, we tend to think of things as weight. When you go to a supermarket and you buy fish, you don't buy a length of a fillet, you buy a weight of a fillet of fish. Um, it also allows us to make comparisons, in this case, across different habitats where you might have different subsets of species, and we can produce a single metric that we can make those comparisons. Um, other really nice thing is it allows us to compare across different marine ecosystems, so we can um, we did a literature review, basically looking at all the studies we could find that had comparable measurements to total amount of fish production in different habitats. Um, these studies are typically done, um, they're very challenging to do, they take a lot of uh, information, potentially a lot of effort in the field, um, or at least a lot of um, modeling, and um, so they're not that many done around the world. Uh, 
but when people do them, researchers do them, they tend to try to, they want to say, look at how productive this ecosystem I'm studying is. So they tend to choose the most productive ecosystems. Um, so things like coral reefs, um, estuaries, near shore estuary lagoons are in uh, the studies we found. And basically all the platforms that, that we estimated production for were higher than anything else we could find. Um, my guess is if this is done across more ecosystems across the world, you're gonna find higher rates than here. Um, but minimally what we can say is these platforms are among the most productive um, ecosystems for fish um, globally. So the, the life stages that contribute most to production are kind of the adolescents, um, not the youngest fish. Um, while the nursery function of these platforms is really important, um, most of them die, so they don't end up um, contributing that much to the overall estimates of production. Um, but it's the kind of uh, two, three, four, five, six year old fish, depending on the species, that are growing a lot, putting all their energy into making their bodies bigger. Um, those are the ones that are really contributing to these production estimates. So this production work says that these habitats are good for those life stages. Um, once fish become sexually mature, they shift that energy um, in terms from growing their bodies bigger um, to putting that energy into producing eggs and larvae. Um, so the largest sexually mature individuals don't contribute very much to these production estimates, but we were interested in understanding whether or not these platform habitats are also um, important for, for these life stages. So we produced, similarly to the production estimates, we produced estimates of reproductive output potential, basically how much eggs um, are fish in a given area going to produce. So we basically take the length of a fish, oops, um, and similarly we use relationships that relate body size to um, fecundity, the number of eggs um, in, observed in their, in their gonad, and we can produce estimates like this. Uh, so we ended up finding 17 uh, species, most of them were rockfish, um, that had really high reproductive output potentials on platforms. Um, we scaled this to the average that you observe on natural reefs, and um, depending on the species, there are anywhere from tens to hundreds of times um, higher reproductive output on the platforms. Uh, for example, on uh, the base of Platform Gale, Boccaccio have 135 times um, the Rocky Reef average for Boccaccio. Um, Lincod on Platform Ellie was 200 times the Rocky Reef average. Um, but a big caveat to this is that the spatial variability is, is huge um, with this. Most of the reefs surveyed of those 70 have zero um, reproductive output for most species. Likewise, for most platforms, there's zero reproductive output for a lot of these species. Um, there's just kind of these hot spots of natural reefs and platforms that have these really high amounts. Uh, and that's due, why, why do the platforms have such high amounts? It's because of all the things I've already talked about. So those recruiting fish come in to the shallower portions of the platform. Um, that's kind of the fuel that, that that maintains these populations of large individuals that have the, the high reproductive output. Um, a big part of it is low fishing effort um, on the platforms. On natural reefs, those largest fishes are removed. Um, so um, these fish that can reside there, the ones where the base of the platform is at the right depth, uh, they can live there for years and years and years, um, and those, those populations can build up um, whereas on natural reefs, there potentially could be fish off of those. All right, so uh, some work uh, that I wasn't directly involved with, um, but it's been published. So what happens to those larvae produced on platforms? Um, the, um, in a nutshell, um, they can disperse long distances. So a couple of different studies um, by um, uh, people at UCSB, Occidental College, uh, Rachel Simon, she's a, a modeler at UCSB, does a lot of the oceanographic um, modeling. But basically, at, for example, platform Eureka um, off Long Beach, the larvae could end up all the way up um, around Point Conception. So there's the larvae that are produced could go and end up seeding reefs um, all around the, the Southern California Bight. Similarly, um, those around um, uh, 
uh, again, uh, your platform Eureka could end up at, at the offshore islands. <laughs> kind of running out of time, but uh, we did look at potential partial removal um, impacts. Um, so this one option that's being considered is basically remove the top 85 feet of these platforms. So um, Milton Love and collaborators did a study that, that demonstrated um, or at least strongly suggests that removing that shallow part shouldn't affect this recruitment pattern for rock fishes. For fishes that only live super shallow, um, they're gonna lose their habitats, but most of the rock fishes live deeper. Um, so the recruitment part of this, the nursery function, shouldn't be impacted very much. Um, and then we've done a couple studies now looking at how would this affect um, the amount, the biomass of fish on the platforms or the production. And um, generally, 80 to 90% should be retained if you remove that top portion. Um, and then most recently, uh, there was um, a study, a part of this study that we've done where we compared if you remove the whole platform and you return it to soft bottom habitat, um, how much production is there going to be? It's going to be a totally different suite of species that live on soft bottom habitats compared to those that live associated with reefs. Um, and you're going to end up with probably 1% to 4% of the production um, relative to what you would have if the whole platform is sitting there. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. I think we've had an excellent overview of the locations of these platforms, their history, the status of decommissioning, complexities and costs of, of decommissioning and removal, and life under the reefs uh, uh, in, in terms of the, the size, the fecundity, and relative to adjacent hardy, rocky reefs, and losses of removal or all or parts, parts of these. Now, we have just a few minutes before we have a break. And so if Steve, John, Ann, and Jeremy, maybe you could all come up. And if anyone has a question, we should have microphones out in the audience. Or, and uh, we'll bring a microphone to you if you give your name and direct your question to an individual, please. Who has the, bring the house lights up so we can see. Who has the first question? OK, I'll bring you the microphone. I'm going to have to run back and forth because people are watching this remotely. And then don't answer till I get back, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Wendy Mota with Congressman Carbajal's office. I wanted to uh, understand um, from what I heard, the studies were going on for 17 years. And uh, I wanted to ask how uh, the marine protected areas were taken into account. And also, if um, the larger species of rockfish could affect other species since they're larger than the natural reefs. Thank you. Who wants to take that? I'll, bring it. I'll take it. Thanks, Jerry. Um, the one study that we were able to do that involved any marine protected areas was one where, where we transplanted the rockfish. They were brand new areas that had been designated. So that was the only thing that we were able to do. Um, we, we were not funded to look at marine protected areas. Um, what was the second part of the question, Jerry? What was the second part? If you thought no, they they home and stay at the platforms. The only the only uh, effect is that uh, that and Jeremy talked about this was that some of the larvae could from those adult rockfish you no know, rockfish are live bearers they have internal fertilization and they live bear their larvae uh, these larvae can travel to the rocky reef so you could have um, a, a young ending up and growing up at natural reefs from the adults at platforms Jeremy, would you like to add to that? Um, I mean, because is this on? Uh, because some of the uh, well, because the fish aren't really fished on platforms. To some degree, you might end up with similar fish assemblages at the bases of those platforms that you could end up with on natural reefs in NPAs after some period of time. Um, so, in that respect, they might be similar. But I, I wouldn't anticipate that fish are going to move from the platforms into the MPAs 
other than them, like for example, the if the platform's too shallow, you're gonna have some larval fish and juveniles growing up on those platforms and then moving out into all the surrounding reefs um, if they, the adults prefer deeper habitats than the platform can provide. And remember, the platform populations and communities are what, well, they're older than 25 years, 30, 45 years. So, you know, it'll be wonderful to look at the marine protected areas in 25, 30 years. <laughs> Who has the next question? Way in the back, Jack, you take. Good morning, I'm Chris Pye with the Ocean Protection Council. I, I, I wondered if either Jeremy or Anne could hypothesize about um, how species um, distribution would be affected by the removal of the upper deck and the first 85 feet of a platform. So uh, I mentioned that one study at the very end. Um, and uh, so I didn't talk too much about the shallowest portions, maybe the top 50 to 100 feet, have somewhat of a different set of species living there. And those are more similar to fish living on near shore shallow rocky reefs. So things like um, kelp bass, sheephead, um, you, you're going to find them living up in those habitats, similarly to, to the uh, near shore rocky reefs, the habitat for those fish are going to be removed and you're not going to see them on the platforms. But there's pretty extensive near shore rocky reefs, um, so there's, I don't think there's going to be that much of an impact um, in terms of impacting those species or those populations. The majority, as Anna mentioned, 90% of the fish on these platforms are rock fish, um, and most of those are recruiting to depths deeper than 85 feet, typically from there, 50 feet or so down to 150. Um, and the study that I alluded to, they looked at um, seamounts, um, uh, uh, some big uh, shipwreck reefs, things that come off the bottom, um, and they found similar amounts or similar types of recruitment to those structures. So they don't think that it's going to impact the, um, the recruitment. So there shouldn't be that much change. The one caveat um, is, uh, as Ann mentioned, you're removing the... Um, the shell, the shell mound production part. So you have, in the very shallow is where you have um, the mussels that are growing and falling down. You're removing the habitat for those. So you're gonna lose those mussels falling down. So that might impact the, um, the shell mounds around the habitats, uh, around the platform habitats, because you're gonna lose the loss of that, potentially lose the loss of live um, mussels falling down, that's a big unknown um, in terms of how that's going to affect, affect things. Um, it might not affect things at all. It might affect things to some degree. That's We're not really sure at this stage. Next question, right here. Hi. Ooh, hello. Um, I'm Libby. I teach at a high school locally, and I'm teaching about business and the intersection of business and the environment. And one thing I wanted to touch on with uh, John Smith was this idea of sharing the cost. Who are they looking at that would be, is this going to end up being a state-owned reef, and then the cost is then bared by the taxpayer? Are we looking at Make monetizing it somehow, or somebody buying it up and turning it into a fishery? How is how? What are they thinking about doing with that? Uh, yes, under the California Marine uh, Legacy Act, uh, offshore platforms can be reefed. The jackets of the platforms can be reefed if the state is willing to take uh, the facility uh, the, and manage the reef and cover the liability. And they also have to get a the permit from the Army Corps. So the, the act basically stipulates that obviously if the industry doesn't have to fully remove the platform, they're going to save a lot of money. The law requires that if these come out in 2023, for example, 80 percent of the cost savings that industry would go to industry from not having to fully remove goes into an endowment fund that funds other state programs, marine resource types of programs. So that's, that can be, uh, you know, in terms of the deep water platforms, there could be a significant contribution to those endowment funds. Uh, 
for removal. We have one. Jack, can you get one a microphone? I'll repeat. So the, the question is, if you remove the top 85 feet or so of the structure, would there be any benefits of taking that, putting it on the bottom or relocating it? Well, you have to remove all of the top side, all the production, uh, living quarters, all of that. All of that material gone, anything that's left above water, like the, it's called the plus 15 deck, decking, all clean all absolutely uh, no contamination whatsoever. And then if you cut it off at 85 feet and you pull that top 85 plus about 15 over and you put it next down on the bottom ne next to the remaining partially, re uh, it's called you know partially cut jacket. Yes, you can do that and it has been done. And actually there was a project off the east coast of Florida that actually towed a jacket and the plus 85 feet towed it all the way eight miles southeast of Miami and put it down. It's called a Tenneco Reef. I dove on that reef. Is there anything to add about the habitat? I mean, the, the bases of these platforms are where you find the most fish, you find the largest adult fish. Um, so adding to that deep habitat could have a potential benefit. Um, and I think that's. Yeah, pretty clear. It, isn't it conceivable also that one or, or a few of these you could retain the, the superstructure and it could be converted to some other use, a research facility, for example, or aquaculture home base? It's, that's not precluded, I gather. No. no. Um, you know, maintenance costs on gigantic towers out in the ocean are, are not insignificant. Right. You know, they're substantial. Well, we could use that endowment fund. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly, and invested well, you could use it forever. All right, who has the next question? Just speak, I can't get it to you. Go ahead. So she was in, this is Phyllis Griffin from the USC Sea Grant, and she was impressed by how the rockfish and the, their abundance and so on. What does that do to the rest of the ecosystem, having so many of these buggers out there? Well, that's, you know, uh, rockfish are, I believe, the most, one of the most, con certainly on reefs, it, it is the class of fish or the family of fish that dominate anyway. That's my answer. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it's a similar suite of species on both. Um, platform to platform, reef to reef, you see different sets of species potentially doing better in, in one or the other. So it, it probably helps, platforms probably help certain species more over others. In some cases, those are species we care about a lot, like Boccaccio lincod. In other cases, they're species that aren't fished, relatively small rockfish. Um, whether or not they're competing with other fish in the region is really unknown. Um, I would say, I mean, to some degree, you're getting recruitment to these platforms, and as the fish grow, they might leave and go to other um, nearby reefs. Um, maybe a different set of species are going to be more plentiful in those, um, but that sort of analysis is beyond what we've done yet. we we'll take take another one. Anybody have? Let's see, I've got one over here. I can get the microphone here. We'll take one, one, two more, this one and one more. Hi, I'm Dave Wiesoff with Audubon. Uh, has anyone examined, if you take off the top 85 feet, the effect on the other vertebrates that are in that biome, including diving birds, uh, seals, sea lions, et cetera? Any, any studies done on that? Um, I, you know, I think cormorants dive deeper than 85 feet, but I don't know to what extent they have to roost first and then, and then dive. So the roosting part's gone. 
uh, if you take off the top 85 feet, um, they, they could certainly still feed uh, because they dive below 85 feet. You know, I'm not, I don't really know a lot uh, about the other diving bird species. Um, however, sea lions certainly, uh, certainly, they're very deep and very shallow. They're going to be all over. Oh, I think the mammals will be able to forage very well at 85 and, and below. But as, as little as I know about the bird species, um, certainly cormorants could. But I, I don't really know the biological connection between time to roost and time to dive. Let's take an, one, uh, one more question before I have a break. Yeah, I noticed that uh, most of the, the talk was about rockfish in the colder waters, but uh, here in Southern California, we have a big yellowtail population in Calico Bass underneath the platforms out here. Uh, could you talk about that? And also, uh, what about crabs and, uh, and lobsters under these platforms? Lots of crabs. And they're big. And lots of spot prong. Uh, uh, two researchers at UC Santa Barbara did a study of uh, the crabs and prawns. And uh, uh, lots of crabs and lots of prawns. Uh, economically important shellfish species. Um, uh, I, I often get surprised why traps aren't set closer to the platform, but I can understand reasons of security that uh, small boats don't want to get that close and things like that. Um, sort of security zones, but uh, Vessel under 100 feet can move very close to platforms. So, you know, I'm not sure what's keeping. Um, they're probably trapping on the pipelines a lot. Uh, but somebody else is an expert on that topic, not me. Don Kent, uh, what about yellowtail off some of these Southern California platforms? I saw you here earlier. Is he still here? What, you want to say a word about that? We'll get a microphone to you. Yellowtail are seasonal in the area and they migrate and they'll typically find themselves aggregating around anything on the surface like uh, a kelp patty or something like that. But um, I, I don't think their association with platforms is, if they, if they do associate, it's very uh, short-lived in, in duration. Um, if sardines move in and out of the platform, they're often followed by their predators, the yellowtails. But it's transient and short-lived, as Don said. Well, we're going to take a break. Steve, you didn't get a question, but I thought you made a compelling case how difficult it is and costly to remove, remove all of these structures. How about join me in thanking all of our wonderful speakers. <laughs> There's coffee and uh, rolls. If, if you go out there, and it's in the hallway, and we're going to start promptly at 1045. Thank you all.
good opening session. And now we're going to turn to the California ex stakeholder panel, which is going to talk about the California experience. And our first speaker is Tom Raftigan. And Tom, if I can fix this. And Tom is going to speak to us uh, about the platform decommissioning enhancement or restoration. He's the president of the Sports Fishing Conservancy. Tom? Good morning. Thanks, Jerry. Um, you know, I asked Jerry what was the best way to approach this, and he said, Tom, if you're good, they'll remember you. He goes, <laughs> If they're bad, they'll remember you. If you're brief, I'll love you. So I'm down to 1438. Um, I'm Tom Rafting of the Sport Fishing Conservancy. In 2010, we carried enabling legislation that, that, that really put forward a, a partial decommissioning program in California. We've been working on this for quite a while. On the final legislation, it's, it's interesting to note that our partners on this were the Nature Conservancy, the Ocean Conservancy, Audubon, um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, Oceana, and a number of other organizations. And I believe, I don't know if it was official, but I, the, the Aquarium of the Pacific also was basically on our corner on this because it made so much sense. Um, I'm a recreational fisherman. I'm a lifelong fisherman, boater, diver. And um, the things that I will go through right now we had this wonderful first session, analytical, uh, very objective, and, and it lays out a lot of the facts. When you start looking at recreational fishing, um, we get a little more subjective. If you've heard as many fishing stories as I have, you understand that there's a lot of subjectivity in that. Um, <laughs> I first got interested in the platforms um, in the channel in, in the 1980s and, and 90s, early 90s. Um, I either had a trailer boat, I live in Santa Barbara, a trailer boat or, or, or a slip in the harbor there, and fished in predominantly the 4-H platforms. And this goes actually to some of the questions that were being asked. Um, you know, I, buddies and I would go out and, and, and one person would take the helm and, and we'd back the boat up to the platform and the other person would fish under the platform. And, and it worked out, you know, it was, um, you don't want to anchor there because uh, the, the platform structure fans out and anchors are really expensive. So uh, it, it was a way of, of managing the fishing. Um, we fished, and, and this goes to one of the questions before, predominantly what we call surface fish, um, the yellowtail, calico bass, bonita, um, but not necessarily Sebasti complex rockfish. If you're fishing the platforms right away, you understand they're deep, they're big fish at the bottom, but there's also a tremendous amount of structure at the bottom, which really makes it a de facto reserve. You, you, you drop down there, and most of the time you're gonna lose your rig before you have time to, to actually do any fishing on the bottom. So we really, we, we call it surface fish, but, but targeted surface fish there. Um, and I think as Ann Bull said, you have sardines, you have sardines, occasionally anchovies. A lot of other forage moves through the platforms. Uh, I remember fishing off there at one point on a party boat, and um, we were probably 30 yards off the platform. And it was actually, this guy catches, hooks big fish, takes them around the boat two times. It was a salmon. But when you put a lot of forage in an area, especially with high uh, relief surface. Um, fish stay there, they hang around. Big fish tend to eat little fish and they stay in the area, okay? Uh, we're getting into the subjectivity. Um, when we look at the Southern California bite, um, it's pretty well understood that between 90 and 95 percent of the bottom is soft strata. And, and what is soft strata? That's mud or sand. And you get recreational fishermen. Um, if you ask a recreational fisherman what's going on, they're the type that watch Saturday morning fishing shows, and it's like, well, if I have this lure, I'm going to catch this fish. 
Uh, that works if you're in the right spot. If you were to look at the Southern California bite, and I'm going to say, you know, fishing out of Ventura or, or, or Santa Barbara harbors, um, where are you going fishing? Well, you're probably going out, you know, to the one mile or to the horseshoe, horseshoe or the armpit or the four mile or the 12 mile. These are all indicators of basically reefs beneath the surface, okay? So you've got this vast area um, within the Southern California Bight. Most of that area does not hold a tremendous amount of fish. Which button here do I push? I don't see it. And the big green arrow. All right, okay. Why do we fish the rigs? Well, we fish the rigs because that's where the fish are, all right? And this is the same with any, any natural reef offshore. You have, and I think the preceding session laid out pretty conclusively that there's a wide array of fish on the platform. The larger ones tend to be towards the bottom. The other thing is, as I said, you get these surfish. You know, you're talking, um, coastal pelagic species and, and more resident surface species that will come and go, but also stay to the reef. I was out diving the reef one time, um, I think it was Gale. Um, we're done with the dive and, um, and one of my buddies, um, Donald, Bill Shedd, said, hey, do you mind if we go down and take some scallops? And I said, no, no, no problem. So, through the tank saw and jumped in again and went down and, and uh, I, I had a goodie bag and, and you know there was 10 scallop limit and I literally was like like that with the goodie bag. We had 20 scallops in it and, and it, it I mean the BC was full just to try and stay close to the surface and uh, Bill goes you know hand me the bag and I thought if I hand him the bag he's going to the bottom and I'm going to be popping on the surface. But the interesting thing about taking the scallops, it was one of those dives earlier in the day that there were some fish around, and, and, and the folks that do the transects, I'm sure, are aware of this. Sometimes there are fish there, and sometimes they're not. But after we popped the second scallop off the jacket, I had calico bass just sitting on my shoulders looking around. It was amazing that, that once that, that uh, some more um, bait forage was in the water, all of a sudden, there's an awful lot of company there. And um, I, I think you find that an awful lot with the surface fish around. Um, and, and again, this doesn't answer the question. I think the, the, uh, a lot of the values, we, we look at, at surface fish, and they tend to produce a lot faster than rockfish. And I'm getting into the area of the scientists more. Rockfish are much longer lived and need a long-term home. The bottom of these rigs offer a tremendous long-term home for them. Um, recreational fishermen, we really aren't very good at what we do. Um, our commitment, our, our, our tackle is designed, you know, you get one hook, one line, there, there are no big nets. We, you know, we've, so we've got to really kind of work kind of hard for what we're, we're after out there. So places with high leaf structure are very valuable. You take a look, uh, and this is predominantly the East Coast recreational fishing has led the charge to put in um, constructed habitat. And, and normally this is, you know, decommissioned vessels. They're cleaned and then, uh, then placed, and, and they become permanent structure down there. We've had some of this in California. Uh, Project Yukon, uh, which was done in conjunction with the city of San Diego. Dick Long was the person that, that, that really was behind that. Um, we also have an artificial reef that would come in, in off of Palos Verdes, thanks to the Montrose settlement. Um, Dr. Dan Parndella, who has worked with Jeremy Cleese an awful lot, has, has really been pushing that forward. But recreational fishermen get behind this, and we get behind this because we understand that, that it takes habitat to have fish, and that, that these constructed structures really do make a difference because it's all about the fish. Um, doing okay. When you take a look at the Southern California Bight again, we, we see an awful lot of soft strata on the bottom. 
and and you know it again brings out the value of the high relief structure we've got over a quarter of a million recreational fishermen that fish this area so it, it you know you get high relief structure marine protected areas have done a fairly good job of, of, of pulling some of that out but but it, it, we need the structure out there um, it was a lot easier to fish the regs pre 9-11 after 9-11 they immediately clamped down on, on, on getting close to the rigs, and then I, I understand that still, the, the, that's the written law. I, I wouldn't be surprised if some people managed to sneak through now and then. And, and again, this is really mostly targeting surface fish. It's not really taking a look at, at you know, the deep benthic species because of um, the problems. It's, you know, don't, you don't just lose anchors down there, you lose gear down there, and um, it gets to be expensive time-consuming. Uh, I want to, I, I, you know, I took on platform decommissioning and enhancement or restoration, and, and I think what we're talking about here really is restoration of ecosystems. Um, you know, we've got a quarter of a million people, a quarter of a million, 25 million people living right upstream in Southern California, and that has a dramatic impact on the resources of the Southern California bite, and whether it's agricultural runoff, urban runoff, um, spent jet fuel from the, the planes flying over, or the boats, the commercial fishing, trawling the bottom, and recreational fishermen are not out of the pit. You know, we, we, we've got some problems that we have out there, and we've, we, we were trying on dealing with them. But the thing is, you take a look at, at what's out there with um, the value of the habitat on these reefs, and, and, and these platforms simply are reefs, uh, the other thing we kind of want to look at is, is not just the subsection there, but the value of the habitat there. And what I have to do is, is look at it in comparison. This is restoration. This is what restoration would look like, okay? This is actually, um, if I could start the video, I'm not sure how. Um, this is actually some, some footage of, uh, oh, God's will. Uh, this is footage of um, the channel out there, Santa Barbara Channel. It was done for a, um, uh, a, a cable, laying a cable. They had to do a little mitigation work. They had to take a look at the bottom. But if we talk about restoring the habitat, removing these regs down to the sea floor and restoring the habitat, this is what you get, okay? And, and I think it's really important to recognize that if if – we go back to what it is. I mean, that, that's, that's what we're looking at there. That's, that's what a restoration effort, a successful restoration effort would look like. And I would like to think that ecosystem restoration is a lot more important than simply restoring um, flat bottom soft strata. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Our next speaker is Linda Kropp, and she's the executive director. You know what? Yeah, you can't steal that, John. Ex executive <laughs> director of the Environmental Defense Center, and she's going to be talking about restoring the marine environment. Linda? Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the sponsors and the aquarium for hosting this uh, conference. It's already been uh, extremely informative. Um, I'm Linda Kropp. I'm actually the chief counsel of the Environmental Defense Center, which is a public interest environmental law firm headquartered in Santa Barbara, formed after the 1969 oil spill to specifically to um, enforce environmental protection laws and represent uh, communities in uh, the south central coast of California. We have uh, been around since 1977, so we have more than 22 years of experience working on offshore oil issues and uh, specifically been working on uh, platform decommissioning issues since 1996. Um, our four program areas, which overlap a lot, especially when it comes to offshore oil, are protecting clean water, the Santa Barbara Channel, dealing with climate and energy issues, and conserving open space and wildlife. So we've already heard about the, um, the platforms associated with both federal and state waters off of our coast. 
So I wanted to give a little bit of background in terms of being a lawyer. Um, we look at the law first, um, and then we look at the science, and we put them together. Um, we have four lawyers on our staff and two scientists. Um, so most of the platforms to be decommissioned are in federal waters, and uh, it used to be that platforms had to be completely removed, and that was changed. Uh, federal regulation was passed allowing a platform to be partially removed as opposed to fully removed if the state has an artificial reef program that the platform would be incorporated in and the state assumes title and liability and U.S. Coast Guard navigational requirements are met, which is the reason why the top 85 feet have to be removed for navigational safety reasons. So even though most of these platforms would remain in federal waters, it would actually be the state, not the oil companies, not the federal agencies, but the states, um, in this case California, that would be responsible for the management um, and liability for the platforms. So for many years, California did not have such a qualifying program. Um, the effort began to establish such a program after the 1996 4-H platform removal project offshore Summerland in our um, service area near Santa Barbara. Chevron wanted to leave the platforms in place or partially decommission them. The State Lands Commission and the California Coastal Commission said no because we did not have a state law allowing that. So they required removal of those platforms. Following that, um, the oil industry and some of the recreational fishing um, organizations started working on establishing such a state program. Um, they worked on several attempts to get state law passed. Um, there was a lot of opposition from conservation groups and from commercial fishing groups. But eventually, in 2010, as was mentioned, AB 2503 did pass into law. And there were really four main reasons why the state law was passed. Uh, first of all, Embedded in the state law is a requirement for a robust scientific inquiry into what the impacts and benefits would be to the marine environment if a platform is partially removed as opposed to fully removed. Second, the proponent said that the cost savings to the industry would encourage early decommissioning. Third, the state would receive some funding from that cost saving. And fourth, to deal with the liability issue, the state included an indemnification provision saying that the oil, um, the owner of the platform had to remain liable. Well, early decommissioning did not happen, um, but the law does include a requirement for a scientific inquiry in addition to the normal environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act. And that came from a report prepared by a select committee through the University of California. Um, the legislature, when it was first addressing this issue, wanted some information from the scientific community. The University of California appointed this uh, select advisory committee, and they came out with a report in 2000, which concluded, based on the science at that time, there was really no evidence that decommissioning platforms in place would provide a benefit, would provide any kind of ecological or regional um, ecosystem benefit to the environment because the proposal is to just simply leave the platforms where they are and if you looked at you know the entire ecological region um, you know just looking at these platforms they weren't going to contribute that much the report uh, recommended that if the legislature was to consider a rigs to reef program that there be a robust scientific inquiry for each proposal that would look at a host of ecological issues, distribution, uh, currents, things like that. And I, and I know, as we've heard today, there has been continuing inquiry uh, done on the platforms, a lot more than was um, evident in 2000. But this recommendation goes more to looking at a project by project proposal and looking at it not just at the platform itself, but what is the habitat value, what is the ecological implication. So that's the current law. Um, the state also has artificial reef guidelines and goals 
uh, which are focused, again, on a more ecological perspective. Um, an artificial reef must increase fish carrying capacity. It, you know, the site selection is important to look at what kind of fisheries you're trying to promote. Uh, reefs should generally mimic natural reefs, which um, the preferred material in the artificial reef guidelines is quarry rock and concrete stubble for that reason. And they should not only attract fish, but provide habitat for shelter, forage, growth, and reproduction. I was um, very impressed by the words of controller Betty Yee last night. I feel um, that her comments did reflect the state's current um, focus on this issue and that she emphasized the need for a robust scientific, in scientific inquiry and a robust public process and stakeholder input. But she said that any decision must be based on the best available science. And I think that's what our current rigs to reef law requires as well as the state's artificial reef guidelines. So with that background, um, the issues that we wanna make sure um, are considered when a specific proposal comes along. First of all, the ecological issues. Just removing the top part of the jacket and the platform is going to change, is going to have impact itself. So whether we're talking about partial removal or full removal, there will be some impacts from even partial removal. The second point is we have to look at what the habitat value will be of the remaining structure, so not having that top 85 feet. And third, um, something that we have a lot of experience with is when we're looking at that bottom habitat, um, the shell mounds that are referred to as habitat, they need to be really studied. Uh, we asked the State Lands Commission to study the 4-H mounds that were left. When Chevron was required to remove the 4-H platforms, they left huge piles that contain shells, caissons, pipeline components. They're about 20 to 30 feet high, about 200 to 300 feet in diameter. They still exist out there 23 years later. So we asked the State Lands Commission to study them and they found that they are not providing any habitat value. They're basically, you know, there's no new live shells being added. They're getting covered with mud. This was back in 2001. So um, we want more recent information. Um, so the habitat value of those mounds has definitely changed um, since the main portion of the platform was removed. Um, another ecological question is um, whether or not the platforms will be fished. And if they will be fished, what is the benefit to the ecosystem? Or should they be designated as marine protected areas? The current state law allows the um, decision makers to decide whether or not um, any of these decommissioned sites should be protected as marine protected areas or whether fishing will be allowed. And I think that will have a huge impact on the impact or benefit to the marine environment. And third, uh, we know that there are some non-native exotic invertebrate species on the platforms. Um, at least three species have been found and the concern is um, that they are they can uh, potentially outcompete native species, and they also could potentially be transported through the water column. So again, looking at an ecological impact, what is the impact of non-native species occurring at the platforms and if they're allowed to remain? The other issue that we are very concerned about is the issue of legacy pollution and toxic contamination. We know from the experience, again, with the 4-H platforms that um, when the platforms operate and there have been discharges of drilling muds and cuttings and produced water, those materials are deposited on the seafloor. And when the State Lands Commission studied the 4-H mounds, they found high contaminant levels of um, things such as heavy metals, petroleum hydrocarbons, polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons, and exceedances of levels for arsenic, lead, cadmium, chromium, nickel, zinc, copper, and more. And this is you know, many years after the platform has be de been decommissioned. And so you know, as we're looking at the final disposition of a platform, we think that the cleanup of the site is extremely important because 
you know, we don't know if any of these contaminants are currently present in the water around these debris sites, um, but certainly they can become present, especially if we have any kind of seismic activity, and this is a very active seismic zone where some of these platforms exist. So we wanna make sure that this issue is addressed. So the first platform uh, to be decommissioned will be Platform Holly, and we've been following the progress um, with the reports from the State Lands Commission. The, under state law, there will be environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act, and then, as I mentioned, there is a special section, section 6613, um, that requires a, an additional um, analysis of the comparative impacts and benefits to the marine environment with full commissioning versus partial decommissioning. So that process will begin later this year. The scoping for the environmental impact report is scheduled uh, for the final quarter of 2020. This process will go you know, through 2021. And our recommendation is for everyone to participate in that process. Uh, we are thrilled with how much transparency the State Lands Commission um, has conducted uh, throughout this process. It's really easy to participate. Um, so I know they're gonna hold a lot of workshops, community outreach, that's great. Um, it's coming upon us to participate. And then to make sure we wait for the science. As Controller Yi said, any decision must be based on the best available science. So we encourage everybody, you know, whatever information we have coming in, whatever goals, we have coming in and whatever perspectives we have coming in, it's really important to wait for the science because every platform is different. Um, every decommissioning project is different and we wanna make sure that all of these issues are addressed on a project by project basis. The final consideration, so I've been talking about you know, very specific decommissioning projects um, and the importance of the science and the importance of looking at the ecosystem. The other consideration um, that we wanna make sure the state considers is the uh, potential impact of a rigs to reef program on offshore leasing. The industry will save money by partially decommissioning a platform instead of fully decommissioning the platform. And environmental groups are very concerned that as industry looks at cost savings through the decommissioning process, that could affect their interest in, in a further leasing and development off the coast. And this is not an abstract threat, it's a real threat. Um, as you know, about a year ago, the Trump administration came out with a new leasing plan that included the entire Pacific region, and most of the interest of the industry is in the Santa Barbara Channel region because there are resources there, there is infrastructure there. Um, if they think that they can pursue their extractive goals at less cost, will that reinvigorate an interest for more leasing and development off the California coast, which would be inconsistent with our state's policies about energy, again, as articulated by Controller Yi last night. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Linda. Our next speaker is Kim Selko, and uh, he is the Executive Director of the Commercial Fishermen of Santa Barbara, and his topic is, how is commercial fishing community uh, affected by rig decommissioning, and I'm sorry, Kim, she. <laughs> Surprised you. Just keeping you on your toes, yeah. I am not a fisherman. I'm not a fisherwoman either. I'm a marine scientist, and I've been um, very lucky to have been able to interact um, extensively with our fishing community over the last five, five or so years, and a little bit 10 years ago too. Um, I got into this because of a passion for sustainable seafood and um, worked with the Long Beach Aquarium long ago on educational programs around that, and that led me to working with our local seafood production and producers. 
Um, and uh, I was very um, pleased to be able to represent our fishing community when the chance was presented to me to become the executive director of Commercial Fishermen of Santa Barbara three years ago because um, our seafood is very sustainable. Um, a non as a nonprofit, our mission is educational. Um, we participate actively in collaborative research and fisheries co-management. We preserve California's fishing heritage um, and our thriving working waterfronts. And we work on educating the public about the health and sustainability of our seafood. Our organization is almost 50 years old and um, has been very successful. Um, let's see, green button. Um, so on the note of education, I want to provide a little context by um, just pointing out that California is a world leader in fisheries management. We've got an extensive network of marine protected areas. 16% of state waters are off limits to fishing. There are many seasonal and gear restrictions. And dozens of fish stocks have been successfully rebuilt in recent years, including a lot of rock fishes. Um, and there are ongoing reductions in fishing permits. Um, and so the state has done really well at constraining fishing to the most sustainable levels and types. Um, and it's important now that we promote and protect the remaining uh, fishing activity instead of kind of letting it drop to zero and getting all of our seafood from imported sources. Um, compared to other international sources, our seafood is carefully managed, benefits our community, has a low carbon footprint and strict environmental laws, um, and yet our seafood trade deficit is second only to crude oil at $9 billion. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do to educate the public on how to choose uh, local seafood and how um, to get it into the marketplace. Um, and it's unfortunate that in the average American diet, uh, seafood only makes up a very small percentage. We uh, eat about 2,000 pounds of food every year, and 16 of that is uh, fish and shellfish, compared to 48 pounds of French fries alone. And uh, you can, I hope all of you know which one is healthier for you. Um, out of that 16 pounds of seafood, only one pound is likely to be from US waters. Um, and so there's a lot of work there to be done. Um, California is um, responsible for about 4% of total U.S. seafood production. In 2017, a, a little over 200 million pounds of seafood were produced. These are the ports, the major producing ports and regions are, uh, along the coast. And you can see that the Santa Barbara Channel stands out for its squid production. Um, and uh, even though squid has a low market price with a high volume, it ends up being uh, one of the top producers by value in seafood as well. And focusing down into the Santa Barbara Channel, uh, you can see there are four ports, and they have very different profiles of production and, and type of production. Squid is focused in the Port of Ventura and Port Wainimi. Uh, Santa Barbara has a lesser production, um, but when you look at the number of boats, we have more boats operating out of the Port of Santa Barbara. Um, it's been fairly steady at about 200 boats a year, um, and about half that in the uh, other two largest ports on the channel. Santa Barbara also benefits from the diversity of the catch that comes in. It makes it a highly resilient fishing community because um, they are adaptable, they're small boats, they're all owner-operated boats. Um, one or two people uh, often on each of these boats only, they're all locally owned and operated. And we bring in a diversity of seafood. Uh, sea urchin is one of the most lucrative and um, most common, um, but we've got a variety of fin fish as well. And despite a decline in our urchin production based on the um, unfavorable water temperatures and state of the kelp forests, um, we've been able to make up for that low production with an increase in the value of our seafood. And that is due um, to hard work on behalf of the fishing community going out there and getting new markets and um, making sure we get the most for our catch. 
Um, the poundage these days um, totals about 13 million in value uh, paid out to the fishermen, and then applying a multiplier, uh, industry standard multiplier, the value to the local economy is about 33 million. So this is not um, a small industry. It really helps um, our coastal economy stay diversified, um, and it is an integral part of our heritage of, of this area of the coast. These are some of the faces I get to work with on a daily basis, and these are the folks who are um, making sure that they have a future. They're often uh, third or fourth generation fishermen, and um, they have worked hard to keep these markets and to develop local markets to keep the prices of the seafood coming in. So these are the folks who have had to cope with the most impact from our local um, oil rigs. And um, I wanna just go through some of the impacts that the rigs have had and then talk about sort of perspectives on decommissioning. The rigs have primarily um, fact featured in the loss of fishing grounds, which have come through many forms over the last years, marine protected areas, et cetera. But um, they take away habitat, um, they make it dangerous to fish nearby, um, and the fishermen have not received um, really mitigation for that loss of fishing grounds. Um, they also uh, suffer when there are oil spills or even press about the oil um, and the potential contamination from oil spills. This is from the 2015 Refugio oil spill um, that was very small in scope compared to most oil spills, but um, really ruined the markets for local seafood from throughout the Santa Barbara Channel due to the news about it, even though um, most of the channel was open and uh, the fish was unaffected. Um, and so it's definitely had a lot of negatives for the fishermen, but it also, as we've seen today, can be a source of fish habitat and um, really has been sort of a extremely exciting result that has come out of all this work we heard today that these rigs can be so productive and that these artificial structures um, can be so useful to restoring habitat and enhancing habitat. Um, so these rigs might aggregate fish away from um, accessible places for fishermen, but also um, are a source of production of fish. And so that's sort of a mixed bag, but um, they are definitely something that the fishermen have learned to live with and respect, I think, the fact that there's important life out on those oil rigs. Um, the oil rigs have also provided important side jobs and sources of funding for safety gear programs and, and other. Um, our fishing fleets are the first line of defense against oil spills, and they are uh, given training and, and the oil boom gear and other uh, gear needed to clean up oil spills and have been um, at the front lines on every oil spill we've had. Now, <clears throat> going on to the decommissioning scenarios, um, really I think the fishermen think about this of, in terms of which is the lowest risk to their livelihoods. And the fishermen obviously uh, have many different fisheries and gear types they pursue and they're not a single unified voice, um, but they um, definitely all have concerns about changes and wanting to understand the costs and benefits and making sure that fishing uh, economy and, and concerns about fisheries resources are uh, front and center to these conversations. So I'll just kind of briefly go through the full removal, partial removal, leaving um, top deck in place, and then possible reuse. Um, Full removal, I think, is perceived as a big unknown, uh, as we've heard today, that it comes with a lot of risk and unknown risk, um, the potential for environmental damage, for things to go wrong, and for us to hit a wall um, on understanding how to fully restore the sites. Um, and in the past, when rigs have been removed, the debris has been left behind, and there have been cases where the fishermen have um, been contracted by uh, state lands and other and the oil companies themselves to trawl and see what happens. Do they get hung up um, on these spots that have, you know, the oil companies that I say have been fully cleaned up? And in every case, they have been hung up. And yet, the then the response has not been necessarily to take out those remaining obstacles. And so I think that there's a lot of um, 
fear that this process will be difficult to navigate and to get to the point of true um, lack of risk and these areas would be returned to trawl grounds. Um, and the contamination that could be sort of resuspended into the water column is also a concern. Um, the idea of partial decommissioning and topping them at 85 feet is, I think, the least popular option because these submerged rig structures could snag a net and lead to um, the loss of a boat. It's, if you're going on a good clip, then you really risk um, just being dragged under if you get hung up on a rig. Now, the idea that you could sort of designate these um, past the footprints of the submerged structures on maps and you know, the fishermen have GPS and can avoid them is kind of great in theory, but in practice, when you're out on your boat and you're dragging a net, it's very easy to the current for the currents to change, and you might find yourself drifting into that area without realizing it, whereas if you have a topside structure as a visual reference, that's much more unlikely to happen. Um, and this is a point that <clears throat> may seem surmountable to us, but the fishermen have been adamant with me that um, having those submerged down there, even if there's a buoy marker on the surface, is still a much greater hazard than um, if the top deck is still in place. Um, so keeping the top deck would allow safe navigation, enhanced fisheries, and potentially new opportunities. Um, and so I think that that's sort of the most popular option for fishermen but that I work with. Um, and it's fully acknowledge that there isn't necessarily a pathway at this point for leaving that top deck in place, um, but it's something that I think we're very interested in learning about and understanding uh, what the possibilities are. The upper jacket produces edible shellfish, um, and this is, we've heard about um, Ecomar, and this is Bob Meek who uh, ran Ecomar. Um, and there's fishermen today in our port, especially urchin divers, who are now kind of looking at how to diversify their income interested in harvesting shellfish again from these rigs. I think it also can't be understated that we need all of the filter feeding we can get in the Southern California Bight. Um, our waters are polluted um, by runoff and the powers of bivalves filtering our water is very well established. Um, we've had losses of natural populations of bivalves along the coast in the last few decades. And um, I think that that's something that we haven't looked into very thoroughly is the value of that filter feeding. Um, the possible reuse scenarios also include mariculture. That could also provide jobs to our fishing community. There's a lot of support for shellfish aquaculture. There's not so much support for finfish aquaculture because of the risks of disease um, and uh, depressed markets from finfish aquaculture. Um, this is just an example of one startup company called Urchinomics that ranches urchins. So this is a, a way that our rigs could serve a, an important role in restoring our kelp forests um, because we could gather up the purple urchins that have overrun the reefs and bring them out to offshore locations like this where they're fattened up by simply um, putting them in bags with the kelp that they eat and taking them to market a few months later. Um, and so this would create an economic opportunity that ties in with kelp forest restoration. Um, and there are other species as well. Abalone could be cultured out at these rigs. Abalone can sell for up to $90 a pound and is um, one of those species for which the economics might work out quite easily. And seaweed farming is also coming to our channel. We have several demonstration projects about to begin. And any time the concept of taking away any fishing ground for these projects, for clean energy, for aquaculture, um, comes up, uh, it, the fishermen automatically say, we've already lost the grounds where the rigs are. Can't these uh, new facilities be tied to the rigs? And they also have a huge fear that this uh, new equipment will be put, at, put in and then removed by storms and lost. And especially when this is a new territory, there's a chance, there's a high chance that a lot of these projects will um, try and fail the first few times and leave gear in the water. And that's been done in the past. So anchoring to the rig structure is definitely a safe bet and as opposed to putting new gear into the bottom. 
Um, and so I'll just end with this uh, concept of the cost savings fund that has come up several times today, uh, the California Endowment for Marine Preservation. Our fishing ports are in bad need of more funding for infrastructure, revitalization, and upgrades, and to um, get ready for an expansion of our fisheries production. Rockfish populations are booming. The government is opening up new area, areas that have been closed in rockfish conservation areas for years to new fishing. Um, they project that there's a lot more fish production to, to come down the pike in the next few years um, because of the success of those rebuilding efforts. And we really need to have that shoreside infrastructure to be able to use that um, food. Uh, there's a lot of species down there that don't just can't be accessed because they have to be trawled to be fished in an uh, economic way. The trawl grounds are either not where the seafood processing is or these uh, in, in our area, the uh, habitat is not very trawlable and it's off limits to trawling. So there's um, a lot of need to problem solve um, this you know, new landscape of highly sustainable fisheries management, but the need to support domestic seafood supply. Um, I, we would hope that some of the money in the cost savings um, could trickle back down to our coastal communities for these very important needs, climate change adaptation, fisheries management. Um, and I'll stop there and take any questions at the end. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Kim. Our next speaker is Evan Zimmerman. He's the executive director of the Offshore Operations Committee, and his topic is robust assessment of environmental impacts and operational safety. Evan. Thank you, Jerry, for the opportunity to speak today. So I'm going to focus on the 23 federal OCS platforms off the coast of California that have been mentioned multiple times today. And I want to start off with kind of the goal of, of my presentation, and that is to establish a clear path to efficient decommissioning of these OCS platforms at their end of life. And what I mean by clear is having sufficient options, pre-approvals for contingencies during operations, and that efficiency is really drawn from having those sufficient solutions available so that you have limited interruptions once you begin operations, because we want, again, an efficient removal or decommissioning of all these structures. So just to go over, I won't dwell too much on this because I think it's been covered uh, already today, but step one is obviously to, to permanently abandon the wells, remove the conductors, then deal with the topside removal, and then the jacket removal is kind of the four steps I'm gonna focus on. And around that, I want to kind of add some highlight to Ann Bull's presentation earlier that on the U.S. federal OCS, there are now less than 2,000 platforms. And in the last decade, there have been more than 1,000 decommissioning uh, successful jobs uh, of, of platforms that existed prior. And since 1986, I wanted to give some stats on the structures that did go into the artificial reef uh, programs in other states, 350 in Louisiana. 145 in Texas, 12 in Mississippi, 5 in Alabama, and 3 in Florida. So one of the things I haven't seen yet today, which I think I, I should touch on, is some of the tools available to complete some of these decommissioning operations. So it's a little hard to tell by the picture the scale of this vessel, which is only one of these in the world. But to give some scale to it, it has two hulls, like a big pontoon boat. And each pontoon is about one and a half times the length of the Queen Mary, parked out here. And on board has a capacity of over 500 people and has a lifting capacity of a top size of uh, around 48,000 tons, which is an excess of, of all these top sides off the coast of California. Another vessel uh, that, again, is, is unique around the world uh, is, is this one here that has two large cranes that together uh, have a very high lifting capacity. And you can see here it's actually removing a jacket section or installing a jacket section, but this can help with, again, the, the scale, because I think you saw how big some of these structures are. This one can accommodate a lot of workers on board to complete the tasks. And with both of these assets, I want to highlight that they work around the world on installation and construction jobs uh, on the offshore arena. So it is, it's not like these are just parked down anywhere in the region here. Uh, these work all over. And because of that, and because they're unique, uh, they many times are scheduled years in advance to work on a project. 
So you can imagine if this is a preferred option for one of the specific platform jobs, then they have to get on a schedule again that could be years in advance. And all of these countries I've noted here in dark blue, they all have decommissioning regulations associated with those countries. Just to show again, this is a, a global market, a global activity. So just some of the facts I wanted to touch on. Uh, there are many different ways to decommission offshore structures. Some of these decommissioning uh, required operations take years of advanced planning and permitting. The wells must be permanently plugged before the structure is removed and that operation can begin. Uh, predictability and certainty in the permitting process is a key planning is key to planning an effect, efficient and robust work plan and is required for contracting those resources like the two vessels I showed you as examples to a, a effectively and efficiently execute uh, the goals of that uh, decommissioning work. Any offshore construction or deconstruction project is going to have some uncertainties involved with it. Uh, in an approved work plan that allows for timely operational adjustments based on the new information that can minimize execution delays and environmental impacts, that's going to be very important. And partial jacket removal options provide potential for minimization of environmental impacts, which I think we've heard about a lot today. And then a couple I haven't listed here, but I wanted to touch on again that the Department of Interior has approved over 550 rigs to reef proposals and only rejected six since 1986. And the Gulf of Mexico OCS uh, has 11 designated reefing areas and they're currently working with Texas uh, to establish another one off of Corpus Christi. So just to provide some other resources that are available to the public for download, you can Google any of these and get the PDFs. The first was an environmental assessment completed by MMS, now Bessie and Bohm, uh, that was completed in 2005, and the Gulf of Mexico is now redoing that study, updating that study, so there should be another one within about a year. Uh, and then the middle one there in color, this one was uh, put out uh, just last year, 2019, and I think it's a good resource that covers kind of the general process. And then another one you might be interested in, if you're interested in what they do around decommissioning in other areas of the world, is this IOGP report, which was published in 2017. And these will touch on methods, impacts, regulations, and processes. So what I really wanted to encourage folks uh, to be interested in is the, the BOEM has the opportunity to do a programmatic environmental impact statement around decommissioning operations, specifically for the platforms that may be decommissioned in the next uh, decade or two. And the value in such a uh, scientific study would be to educate the public on the operations, the technologies available, procedures, and impacts of those activities on the environment. Uh, it enables the agency to understand and assess the full scope of the decommissioning work and the options to execute and associated environmental uh, impacts with those operations. It provides an opportunity for the public to provide comments and feedback for that uh, consideration by the federal agency in their analysis of the permit applications, and I think that's key. And it uh, enables the operators to evaluate alternatives for accomplishing the objectives while minimizing those environmental impacts. And it positions the agency to approve the evaluated alternatives and proposed methods in those site-specific uh, decommissioning operations. And then talking about operations and, and the process of actually completing these engineering jobs to, to decommission a structure, I just kind of wanted to talk about some of the main uh, things that you have to consider. Uh, so with a specific platform decommissioning plan, you're going to have to deal with, obviously, uh, coming up with your plan, getting the regulatory approvals, you're going to have to consider the seasonality of when you might be able to do certain types of work. All of these vessels and operations may have weather sensitivity that they only work in certain weather conditions, so that has to be figured into the plan. And then with the specific tools that you may select in your plan, you've got to then, again deal with scheduling, which may take years of advance uh, notice and contracting. You're going to have to come up with contingency plans because with any complex operation, you don't want to be in the middle of an operation and then re-engineering how you're going to do something. So you have to have contingency plans in place, and it is very important to have those uh, approvals for those plans so that it's, it's a very clear process to get the work done. Uh, and then coordination with multiple contractors, subcontractors, and other stakeholders. 
And so uh, I want to wrap up a little early uh, with the importance of timely and effective stakeholder engagement. I was very encouraged uh, by this event today and the invitation again from Jerry uh, that uh, this is really going to help early in the stage to the understanding of these proposed activities and hopefully better aligned goals of the multiple stakeholders. Uh, a perceived shared objective is the completion of the decommissioning activities in a timely uh, way with a minimal environmental impact. Uh, development of the programmatic EIS in alignment with NEPA objectives provides a predictable process and forums for stakeholder engagement. And again, time is now to engage in this process. So thank you very much. Thank you, Evan. You set the record for timeliness. Our uh, first of all, I want to remind you, this is not only being streamed live. It will be, every, all the proceedings will be posted on our website, and we will produce a, a brief written overview report. That'll take a little longer, but uh, the posting will take place promptly. So to close out our morning session, our final speaker, speaker is Angela Mooney Darcy. She's the executive director of the Sacred Places Institute for Indigenous Peoples, and she's going to speak on platform decommissioning legal and cultural importance of engaging with California coastal native nations. Angela. I always have to do a mic adjust. I'm 4'11", so see if this balances. Miuyam, my name is Angela Mooney DRC. I am a Hashiman. Our ancestral homelands are in what's now known as Orange County. I want to first take a moment to acknowledge that we're here on the ancestral homelands of the Tongva people. And I further want to take a moment to ask everybody in this room to try to go on a bit of journey with me and to try to understand these platforms and associated onshore and offshore extractive industries as violence not just on the land, but violence to the people. And so in taking a moment to reflect on that, I want you to also reflect on Long Beach and just go outside the doors during lunch, look around, and understand that what we see here and what we see here that may even be of value and may you know, bring people together and have a lot of positive impacts is still the visual and environmental representations of centuries of violence to people and land. And so when we think about that, I want you now to think about decommissioning oil platforms as an opportunity. And an opportunity not just for restoration, not just for potential economic benefit for some in California, but also as an opportunity to address this violence to the land and to the people. So we've seen a lot of maps today. This is one that we haven't seen. I always try to show this map because it's critical for folks, if you're policymakers, if you're lawyers, if you're environmental advocates, if you run a multi-million dollar institution like the Aquarium, whomever you are, if you work in California, I need for you to understand that this was and continues to be a thriving place for hundreds of unique and distinct cultures. There are over 100 federally recognized Native nations in what's now known as California, and there are over 50 non-federally recognized nations. It's important to note at this point that while at the federal level, um, federal obligations, including that of BOEM, to government-to-government -to -government consultation run only to federally recognized tribes. However, what's critical to note is that in California, that is not in fact the case. The state of California very much acknowledges and understands its government-to-government -government consultation obligations with all California nations. And the state of California, in fact, in, in fact defines California Native American tribe as all federally recognized and non-recognized tribes on the contact list maintained by the California Native American Heritage Commission. What's particularly significant about that information for the purposes of a conversation around offshore drilling decommissioning platforms is that when you look at the coast of California, the majority of these 40 native nations with ancestral ties to coastal homeland 
are non-federally recognized. And that's why it's essential that we all have this understanding and that we work to be allies to these nations. So this is a little bit closer dive into the area where we're at now. You can see um, we're in Tongva homelands. My homelands are just to the south. This map is courtesy of my tribe's cultural center and museum in San Juan Capistrano. I think that I, I always include this slide because it's important to me that people understand we as indigenous peoples aren't just some figment that existed and was killed out by a state-sponsored attempted genocide over 200 years ago. We're people who have a incomprehensible capacity for resilience. I'm hearing a lot of folks talk about resilience today, but I'm not hearing other than Betty Yee, and I really want to you know, pay her respects in her talk yesterday for not just acknowledging that we're on Tongva land, but actually making the effort to weave in tribal perspectives into that talk. And that is, in fact, the kind of disruptive energy that we're all going to need to take on if we want to see the cultural shift that needs to happen so that we can have not just a healing of the land, but a healing of the relationships between the people. And to put it simply, we're all missing out on such a tremendous and unique opportunity if the folks who know the names of these places 10,000 years ago are not at the table in these conversations. And I, I feel a little bit of tension right now, because on one hand, I'm really grateful that State Lands Commission responded to the letter that Sacred Places Institute for Indigenous Peoples and East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice sent, saying, wait a minute, y'all are listed as co-sponsored on this event that says in the title, For the Public, and there's no tribal representation on any of the panels. There's no environmental justice representation on any of the panels. And it costs $125 a person to attend. Yet state lands, you just adopted this great environmental justice policy. And so when I say it's time for us to be disruptive, what I mean by that is that we are all embedded in a system that is built on stolen lives and stolen land, right? That is the infra institutional infrastructure in which we live. And so it's not enough to just adopt policies and commit to doing better moving forward. If we're not being disruptive in trying to dismantle that system, then things will continue business as usual. So I'm super grateful for the opportunity to be here. And folks organizing these kinds of events need to do better. Because it should not be the case that I stumbled across this event. And I'm going to call out the Aquarium of the Pacific for a minute, because y'all do such a wonderful job every year for the past 10 or more years hosting Monpatam, which is the gathering of saltwater peoples of the Pacific. So while many entities may not actually have an extensive list of tribal leaders and tribal traditional cultural practitioners, that is not, in fact, the case for the Aquarium of the Pacific. I wanted to do due diligence, so before I came to this talk, I contacted multiple tribal leaders who participate in Monpatam, who are from coastal nations. No one received notice of this event. And I know the aquarium has contact info for well over 100 cultural, coastal California native traditional cultural practitioners. We need to be at these tables. And so if you get one thing out of my talk, it's that I hope you'll do better, all of you, to be disruptive, to be the disruptive forces we need. Because when we're not, this is what we're looking at. The previous slide showed our ancestral territories and names. This is the route of the El Camino Real, which is the route of colonization in California. It's the route of Doctrine of Discovery. For those of you not familiar with Doctrine of Discovery, it's the doctrine which essentially says that as indigenous peoples, we're savages and therefore not entitled to land ownership, merely to rights of occupancy in our own homelands. And so while I understand that as a state, California needs to think about the economy and the blue economy, I can tell you last night when I was listening to the live stream, I got chills. And I got chills seeing the beautiful artistic representation that has this line of blue economy running through it. And it scared me because I understand that this slide, this slide of imperialism and colonization, this is what happens when you don't have consent or buy-in from environmental justice and tribal communities. You get an overtaking of the territory, you get an exploitation of the people. Not anything that's consent-based, and not anything that's positive or working to displace this violence. 
Again, I said, you know, I want to acknowledge that we're on the ancestral homelands of the Tongva people. I wanted to use this slide in particular. It's Jessica Calderon, Annie Mendoza, and their son, Michael Mendoza. This is at the Santa Monica Pier. And I, I show this because I think a lot of times, while people are, are kind of there in understanding that we existed as one time, I think there's a tremendous disconnect in terms of business, in terms of the environmental movement, in terms of pretty much everybody in understanding that it's not just for us and what happened in the past, it's for the people that are coming after us. We still have tribal citizens who are learning to speak their language, learning their cultures. And so I show this slide to help you remember, one, all spaces, even spaces that don't seem like cultural spaces at all, such as the Santa Monica Pier, are still spaces that can be spaces of reclamation for traditional tribal people. And that matters, and that matters because we're still having kids and we still have upcoming generations of tribal community members who need access to such spaces. So why is engaging with California Native American tribes important, if you didn't get that already? Um, again, there's over 40 California nations with ancestral homeland along the coast. And all four of the offshore platforms and state waters are within the ancestral homelands of non-federally recognized tribes. Um, with the exception of Holly and Santa Barbara, which includes uh, federally and non-federally recognized Chumash, the other ones listed are exclusively within the zones of non-federally recognized tribes. Bureau of Ocean Energy Management has explicitly and repeatedly told us that they do not believe they have a legal obligation to consult with non-federally recognized tribes. So when we're talking about oil platform decommissioning or when we're talking about you know, threats of renewed offshore drilling, Unless you're in one of those areas where Santa Ana's Band of Chumash Indians has jurisdiction, you're going to need to be supporting the non-federally recognized tribes because I can guarantee you we will be your best environmental justice allies in the fight. Now, someone in the last presentation or one of the last two presentations mentioned um, resources that are available. And it's funny because you know I know nothing about offshore platform decommissioning, and so I was really stressed when I got the opportunity to speak. Be careful what you ask for, right? Um, so I looked at all those resources you know, as I was preparing for this talk, and I was really disappointed because the um, interagency report that came out last year, a citizen's guide for decommissioning offshore oil platforms prepared by State Lands Commission, BOEM and others, it lists all these state laws, all these federal laws. It talks about cultural resources, but it doesn't mention tribal nations once. And yet, there are multiple state and federal legal obligations. So my one call is as an action item, state lands, redo that document. You know, and, and for everyone, when you're preparing maps, all of these maps should have the tribal territories listed because it shouldn't just be up to me or the handful of other tribal people who may get lucky enough to be in these spaces to raise that, those issues. It needs to be up to all of us. And I wanted to show these because I, I wanted to highlight that while multiple state agencies are started down the line of getting there in terms of at least acknowledging the link between state-sponsored attempted genocide. And by that, for those of the, you that aren't aware, I mean that um, after, after California became part of the United States, multiple um, private, uh, privately organized Indian hunting militias were founded. This was literally private individuals forming groups and going out and killing California Indian people. The state of California reimbursed those private Indian hunting militias over $1 million, and the federal government reimbursed the state. So again, when we talk about a blue economy, my question is, where are the tribes? Our lives were literally on the line. It was our extermination that was sought and called for by the first governor of California. Governor Newsom just released an executive order last year um, calling for an ap uh, apologizing to, for that you know, bad moment in history and creating a truth and healing commission. But again, like how does that healing, how does that state effort to heal and to acknowledge state-sponsored attempted genocide connect in terms of this conversation if tribes don't, you know, aren't entitled to part of the resources that are coming out of this blue economy? And here's again the Coastal Commission's environmental justice policy. I think there's a timer somewhere, but I'm too short to see it, so somebody just give me a signal. I don't know. Um, <laughs> And state lands, tribal consultation policy, and environmental justice policy. 
And this document's not out yet. Um, it should be, I just reviewed one of the final drafts last week. So it should be coming out hopefully within the next few months. Once it's available, I encourage you all to get this document because this is a, a tribal consultation document that was actually created by and for Native nations, federally recognized, non-federally recognized from Oregon, Washington, and California. And so I encourage you all to get a copy of this document when it becomes available. And because I'm assuming I'm probably almost out of time, I, I want to end with this as final reflections on engaging with California coastal nations. This is Maura Sullivan. She's the director, our, director of our Ocean Protectors campaign and our Just Transitions campaign. And she's a citizen of the coastal band of the Chumash Nation. She's a linguist. And I, I chose this photo because to me this symbolizes everything that is right in terms of how we need to be moving forward when we're talking about our coastal lands and waters. And that is that indigenous people, the people who've been here since the beginning of time, the people who manage to maintain a successful relationship with land in place and not pollute, not devastate, you know, our home, these are the people that need to be in the driver's seat. And too often, we're not even at the table. So again, in closing, I just want to say, um, you know, be disruptive. Be disruptive in your work. Ask yourself in these conversations, you know, what kind of fees am I charging? Um, maybe technically it's accessible because it's live stream, so I appreciate that. But, but is it the right move to charge $125 a person for something that, to have a conversation around a subject where the most economically exploited people are going to be priced out of attending? You know, are there tribal people at the table? There are, there are easy questions that all of you can ask yourselves in these moments. Because I promise you, if we want to save the ocean, I mean, look what just happened with NEPA and the rollbacks and climate change denial, all of that, right? You need indigenous people. You need people of color to be not just a part of, but leading these ocean conservation movements. So my final thought is remember on whose lands you walk and commit to being disruptive to bringing about a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. We have had a wonderful relationship with tribal communities through our Moompatam Festival for more than a decade, and we should have included one of you in, on the speaking agenda without being prodded by the State Lands Commission, and I take responsibility for that, and we'll, we will do better. And I will invite you back to speak about your new guidance document when it becomes available. As to cost, let me just say we believe this issue is important enough that putting this event on is costing the aquarium, the aquarium, more than $50,000 to put this on. So we apologize for not including you, but I don't apologize for the, the registration fee. All right, now, because even with that, it's gonna cost us 50. Tom, Linda, Kim, Evan, and Angela, come on up, please, and let's see if we have some questions. We have, uh, let's see, we have 15 minutes before lunch. And we should have a couple of microphones in the audience. Yes, we do. And you can, you, can direct, you can direct your questions to anyone, please, and a microphone will be brought to you. Who has the first question? Anybody? Yes, right down, down Linda, down here, second row in the front. Oh, oh we got that? All right, Evan and then down here. OK, thanks for This one's directed to Angela. Angela, there's been a focus on offshore platforms, but the decommissioning of these platforms is also associated with onshore facilities that have uh, some impact. Could you comment on that? Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, because I totally meant to. And then the other thing I forgot to bring up with regard to um, specifically the offshore piece is that all along the coast, at least in Southern California, the sea level has already risen. So we have cultural sites that are submerged. We have ancient village sites that are submerged. And so um, it's particularly important with coastal nations to talk about this. But absolutely, the connection to, to onshore, right? I was thinking about that as I was looking through some of the slides and hearing the dates. Like a lot of the dates is when these um, platforms and these uh, associated infrastructures were approved predate um, state and federal cultural resource protection and tribal consultation laws. So it's quite possible that even though those areas may have been um, very physically damaged, um, 
it may be the case that there was not appropriate engagement with tribal nations beforehand. So absolutely, it's critical to talk with tribes. Um, I was just wondering what a little louder, please. Michael. What precautions are taken to minimize the risk of contamination or things such as oil spills after plugging and abandoning wells in areas where there's especially heavy seismic activity, like here in California? Who, who wants to take that? So what a, you, you want to do that? I'll start, but I'm sure <laughs> others will want to respond as well. Um, thank you for that question. Um, in terms of the actual decommissioning operations, there are federal and state requirements to deal with potential leaks. Um, in fact, when the Elwood piers were being, um, when the wells were being plugged and abandoned, um, there was a situation there where they had to stop the operations and clean up some oil. It turns out it was probably unrelated to the operations, but they immediately had to stop the operations and address that. And some of the folks from State Lands Commission could probably um, give more information about that, but there will be, and I've talked to folks from the Coast Guard, and they will be, you know, present to make sure that there's a response to any kind of spill that may occur. Um, with respect to the seismic activity and the toxic materials, um, I want to clarify that, in our opinion, full removal does not mean leaving your toxic junk on the seafloor. What happened at the 4-H platform should not have happened, and we're still trying to get those mounds cleaned up. So I know when people talk about, well, full removal, but then you've got this toxic debris. No, full removal is by law and by the permit conditions. Those sites were supposed to be restored to their natural environment, um, and they haven't been, so that's a violation. So I think it's critically important that under any decommissioning option, and full removal may be the best way to do this, is you got to clean up that toxic debris. Who else would like to add to that? Evan? <laughs> I mean, I, I, not much to add. I mean, there are obviously the state and federal laws that will have to be uh, completed. It is, does have full oversight of the federal agency for all the federal platforms. Uh, a lot of these reservoirs uh, are very low pressure, uh, and in many cases, I think we saw some of the earlier, the cables and pumps that are installed to actually get the oil to come out of the ground. Uh, but they're all permanently plugged and abandoned down at the reservoir level, uh, and again, in accordance with federal regulations. There are also quite a number of natural seeps, in particular in the areas near Holly. Um, so it, it, there will be, like Linda mentioned, there are issues that happen on shore that really were not directly related to uh, decommissioning. Take, let's take another question. Who has one? Anybody? Yes, don't no, down here, Adina, down the back in the back, and then up here. Yeah, you mentioned those uh, those two big crane vessels that are out there, all foreign flagged. Uh, will they be allowed to work in state waters? Are you referring to like uh, U.S. flag coastwise Jones Act compliant vessels? It depends on where they, where they, where the act, what the activity is and where the cargo goes, right? So to be Jones Act, it would be two coastwise points. Like for instance, uh, one of the presentations talked about potential uh, disposal of the jackets, topsides, etc. If those are done outside the United States, then that's not the second point is not a coastwise point. It's international, so the international vessels would work. The U.S. Coastwise Fleet has nothing in that capacity to lift the top sides, as we saw huge top side structures, massive jackets. It's not something that's very economically viable, thus those vessels work the global market, because not any one country has that kind of a market to support such a large construction tool. There was a um, conversation earlier about how much money it costs to get Platform Holly back up um, and able to be decommissioned. So in talking about reusing the platform from and keeping the top side, I'm just curious if there's any precedent for doing that because it seems like it would be cost prohibitive to take care of a top side for say a shellfish aquaculture operation, even though that sounds um, you know, like a, a, a way to reuse the platform. I'm just curious if that has any economic feasibility. Jim, I think you ought to start with that. 
Well, my understanding is that some of the platforms near Huntington Beach um, are now in a decommissioned state with the top deck still on them. And I don't know if someone else wants to correct me on that. Um, but I think that, you know, all of this has a lot of unknowns and lack of pathway. And so um, I think that you have to think creatively about how to, you know, find companies that are willing to take on these projects um, and have collaborative approaches to them with the state. Kevin wants to add to that. Yeah, I don't have a specific name for the project, but I, I do understand in the Gulf of Mexico there may be a precedent very soon because it looks like there might be at least one platform that's going to go over and become basically a research uh, vessel, if you will, a, a fixed jacket platform. So I think watching that space is important because it may provide a, an example of how it's been done successfully if that moves forward. But that'll be happening in Gulf of Mexico, and it's a jacket structure similar to these, I believe. And I, I think also, remember the current language is, is that it has to provide a net environmental benefit. So this will all be looked at in detail before anything happens. Let's take one down here. What do you want to add to that? Yes, for the 23 platforms in federal waters, as I mentioned with the regulation, um, any decommissioning um, that leaves some of the platform in place has to comply with U.S. Coast Guard navigational requirements. So the top side for the federal platforms has to be removed. Okay, we'll take one down here. Um, I've heard that the structures themselves are not toxic, but I, I also hear discussion about heavy metals uh, being found at the bottom and other toxins and I'm I'm trying to reconcile those and understand where the heavy metals and other toxins are coming from and if there is more of a risk of of those toxins being released into the ocean if there is complete removal as opposed to leaving the base there who would like to start with that Thank you. Um, so the toxins in the mounds um, at the 4-H site um, are from the drilling muds and cuttings and produced water that was discharged from the platform, so not from the structure itself, but from the discharges. And um, the question about whether or not they could be released during removal operations is something that clearly would be analyzed in the environmental review, and that's what we've been trying to um, secure with respect to the 4-H platforms for the last 20 years is to look at different removal options and what would you know have the least impact to the marine environment versus leaving them in place and what would that impact be? Uh, when the 4-H platforms left and the, and the mounds were in place, uh, State Lands Commission conducted consecutive mussel bag tests where they left mussels on the shell mounds for a period, and I think they're a month at a time, came up, analyzed, and there was absolutely no contamination that moved from there. They've done cores on the mounds, and while there are some contaminants in it, the way I heard it compared to was about the same you'd find in a wastebasket in an office. So there are contaminants there, but it, when you look at the background materials, uh, it, let's take each case as it comes up. Anybody else want to comment up here? No. All right, let's take, we'll take one more question before we bake for lunch. Down here, right, right there. Um, Linda, I was interested in your talk when you mentioned the under the law, um, one of the requirements for reefing would be that the state takes title and liability. Um, in light of people talking about these being used after they're reefed, is do you know are there restraints on how, um, say, a state lands commission or somebody like that would lease a property? to a user like an aqua farm facility or anything under the law? Do you, do you know? I'm, I'm other constraints, I think, is what I'm... I know there are some folks from State Lands Commission in the audience who can probably answer this better. Um, I know that in the current state... So the federal regulation said the state has to assume title and liability. In the state law, there is an indemnification provision for the oil companies that turn the platforms over to the state. But in terms of your question about um, you know, other future lessees or users of the platforms, I would probably re defer to someone from the State Lands Commission. But that's a good question. We have people from State Lands. Marina, would you like to comment on that? Give her, give her a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> or 
Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer Lucchese, she has the final word. Yeah. So, um, hi, I'm Jennifer Lucchese. I'm the Executive Officer of the State Lands Commission. Um, in terms of the question, if I can remember it properly, um, the State Lands Commission does have the authority to release um, any full or partial decommissioning platform for different types of purposes, including aquaculture. It sh should be of note that um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife actually has the authority um, and the jurisdiction for aquaculture leasing in state, prop in state waters, so we would have to work that out um, with them. Um, but um, that is an option for the State Lands Commission to decide um, at a future date. Th thank you, Jennifer. So please, please thank our panelists for, for their great talk. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Lunch uh, is available up on the, the veranda. We're going to start promptly at 1.50, but it gives you a lot of time to have some discussion with, with people and continue to ask your questions. Thank you all. <laughs>